Are we Let's doing? try this again. <laughs> we're we cutting the, cut the video. Are we're we live. live. Okay. We're, we're live now. Cool. Yeah. All right, man. No, I was just saying, I, I'm more out, man. Um, it was windy out there today. Went over to Egypt for four or five hours, five, six hours, something like that. And uh, the wind is, I don't know, man, that little boat. I got it. Like I was saying, I got to get a new trolling motor. I just, uh, I'm so tired of, you got to sit there and stand on that trolling motor. You got to have it on seven just to hold yourself. And it wears you out. And then yeah. you're trying to make a cast. You're trying to focus, you know, you're fishing out there. I was fishing for some offshore fish. I'm throwing out there in like 30 foot trying to, you know, work a, a spoon or a jig or something, 30 foot of water in the, in the wind. And it's, I don't know. I'm, I think I'm going, you know, I had, I got enough money to buy like a uh, forward facing sonar or upgrade to like an old tricks. And I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to get the trolling motor. I mean, I need the trolling motor for sure. So I've got to, uh, I don't know. I got to make some changes. It's driving me nuts. It's making me mad. I feel like I'm not catching as many fish because I don't have that trolling motor to hold me in place. You know, my buddy Ron, he's got the Ultrex and he will, uh, he'll, he'll idle up past the fish and then get, you know, like 30 yards from them and hit spot lock with the nose into the wind. And then he'll just walk off the back deck and fish off the back deck into the fish. I mean, it's so much easier. You got a nice wide yeah. platform. Oh, it's a whole lot easier. Yeah. You know, you're not bouncing around. Yeah. I just, um, uh, I don't know. It's just, that's just been on my mind. Um, you guys out here, you got a preference. Has anybody messed with, uh, Lawrence ghost or the Garmin or even the Ultrex? I mean, I've got, you know, it's funny. We're, you know, we talk about the ghost. We talk about the Ultrex and everything else. You just don't hear nearly as much about that ghost. It's, I don't know if they're keeping it quiet for a reason. Cause there's a lot of guys, a lot of professionals out there that aren't using it in fishnet. Like oh, you, yeah. you just don't hear a lot about it. I mean, yeah. I see ads and stuff for it, but I mean, over the you know professional level, you just don't hear a lot. I'm just wondering. You know what? Let's get Mike in here. Or forget that had him here. Everything I've <laughs> everything I've read about it, it's pretty solid motor. What what do you what do you know about it, Mike? You heard me that Lawrence Ghost. All I know is Trace is it kicks ass. Your audio is down. No it audio, might be, dude. It might be us. <laughs> My me, we nope. still can't hear you. You look good though, man. Yeah, rocking the Josie Wells T. I'm not muted. You got no audio. This is gonna be I'm like a. I'm gonna leave and come back in if you can read lips. Nothing. He's I'm gonna drink a whole lot more so we can read his lips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you hear us mike thumbs up if you can hear us <laughs> okay yeah we still can't hear you that's weird i don't know uh mike go back into your settings on the on stream yard and see if they you got your mic on in there is it right here uh hey hang on mike hey try that hey hey test can you hear me oh, still not hearing you why don't i get out and get back wow. in what is this? this is getting weird here I don't know what's Two going weeks on. in a row. Yeah. He's looking fresh, man. He's rocking the beard. <laughs> Got the Chelsea Wales shirt on. Got the AK AR-15 hat on. Looking looking dope, man. Looking dope. <laughs> What'd you say? Uh, should I get out and back in? Should he go out and back in? Hang on. Let me try. Well, we should have done this a long time ago. Try it now, Mike. Check, check. Still don't have no. it. I didn't know that was in there. That's nice huh. to know, though. Cool. Yeah, guys, this is a... Uh, yeah, try going like, back out and come back in, Mike. It's like low-budget live. <laughs> it's real low-budget. <laughs> uh, Tom says we can hear him. Oh, Brandon says he can hear him. Oh, Jesus Christ, guys. I'm an idiot. You need a new IT no. guy. No. <laughs> yeah, we do we need, need a new IT, IT guy. guy. You need to turn the volume up? Yeah. You gotta turn the volume up. Let me get out over here. We're gonna try this again. Mike. No, I know what it is. You know what it is? Hey, Mike, how's it going? You didn't have your volume turned up. Yeah, right? it's this guy. Yeah, I, Eddie Van Halen once said, "Volume is tone." That's why his guitars just had a volume knob. They didn't need a tone knob. Turn that shit up. Yep. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> with all kinds of changes here lately, and I've just with everything last week, and and I think I actually know what happened with last week. 
So completely unrelated to fishing, but IT related. One time I went, I had a project due out and I was panicking because I had got up to do something, set my headphones down, went up and I came back and my computer was just scrolling. My AutoCAD was just scrolling uh, over and over and over like the, the, the command line. And I was like, what the shit? And this is like before, you know, I couldn't get it. I ran upstairs, the IT guy all panicked and he came down here. And as soon as he looked at my keyboard, just started laughing. And I was like, I had set my headphones down the escape button. <laughs> just escaping over and over again and i was in a panic because i was like no my computer cannot take a crap right now i got a project to do out i'm trying to get i was thinking i was getting out to leave for the lake for the weekend and you know, it was like i'd already taken thursday off and was getting ready to leave for thursday friday and this was like on a wednesday and i was just like oh this does it's not happening right now and it was just <laughs> me setting my headphones on my escape key so we've all done stupid crap yeah, it's it's oh, easy to do. David, David fired me. David says you're fired, man. We can't fire him. We don't have nobody else to replace him. Yeah. <laughs> grass is grass isn't always greener any, anyway. Yeah, so. Right. So hey, we were talking. Um, you were probably talking too about the trolling motors, the Lorant. Trey has five. one, and all I know is he says it kicks ass. Well, okay. Well, he's got what? Which one? The Lorant. Is that called the Ghost. Ghost? Yeah. Greg does. I didn't know that. No, not Greg. Trey. Trey Sorry does. For my hillbilly mush mouth, but Trey. All good. Trey. Okay. TH so he, Customs, he the it. man. Yeah. And he said it's it said it's awesome. And one thing I thought was cool is the extra buttons to program. So you can put your talons or your power poles just on the buttons on your trolling motor and you don't have to put any other buttons on the floor. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's got it's got it's got open slots, I guess, so to speak, that you could pro you could make that whatever you I mean, I'm sure you could make it do other things too, whether it's switch screens on your graphs or whatever. It's that whole one boat. If you had Lowrance electronics, it's like that whole hummingbirds. They they kind of go on the same route as hummingbird with the one boat network thing. And I, I can't remember. Isn't that you know how Motor Guide has the touch of, on the pedal on one side and, mm -hmm. and um, Minkota has it on the other? Isn't that? Oh, I know it all too well. I These buttons are off to the side of that. They're down okay. on the lower part, like on like where your spot lock and your north. And your power switch is on the on the what do I have? The Ultrex. Yeah. The, the Ultrex is the automatic one, right? Yeah. Yeah. You've been happy with that? I have. I mean, and I had a motor guide for over 25 years before I switched to that. And Greg had the four tracks, and I was impressed by the sheer power of it. But then you add the other stuff onto it, you know. But I, I think it's from what I understand, what people have told me that both the Minn Kota is kind of loud compared to some of the newer ones and compare, yeah. you know, especially I think the Garmin's brushless, right? I'm not so sure the ghost if it is or not, but tra if Trey gets on here, he'll know. I think they're both brushless. I'm pretty sure. I, I mean, think I that's all the difference in the world as far as the, the noise goes. And then I know, uh, well, you got in the boat with me when we got in the Camus with Gavro. Right. And he said that Garmin was more power than he'd ever seen in a trolling motor. Yeah, he was saying that, that guy's owned that guy's owned his share of boats and spent his share of hours in a boat. So that's not coming from a guy that that's his second trolling motor. Yeah, I've got to I've got to upgrade. I mean, it's just getting ridiculous. I'm out there in that ten boat and <clears throat> I can't hold myself in the wind. I know one thing that I did is I had a three blade prop on that when I first bought it. Mm -hmm. I fish so much grass that the two blade is what you want in the grass. It just goes through the grass a lot better, but you lose your power. Tour. Yeah, you just yeah. low end the, the get you going part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't. It's almost like a you know people change their props out on their big motor. I need to like change my trolling motor props out. I guess each time I you do if you're not going to be in grass. I mean, shoot, they don't weigh nothing. I, I've always got a spare in my boat. Yeah, I got one in there. I just I don't think about changing it until the wind's blowing like 20 miles an hour, and I'm trying to hold get out you the, get you that prop nut like I got. I mean, it's kind of you know what I'm talking about. Then you don't even need a wrench or nothing. You just reach down there and grab it with your hand and just twist it off and slap the prop on it. Don't take no time. Is that that TH Marine? Prop? Yeah, no yeah. Way. It was it was owned by somebody else and like everything in the marine industry, it ends up becoming TH Marine, whether it's locker bar or. Could could you tell a big difference with that thing balancing the blades up? Honestly, no, I, I I don't. But if they tell me it is and they tell me it's keeping it cooler up there and eh, and it kind of like I said, just the convenience of the quickness to slip it off real quick without having to get a wrench out to see if we got any line at there. And if, if the end of the day, me and you are standing there talking, Greg, around the boat before we both take off, I can spin that thing off and see if I got any line or anything in there. Maybe save, save myself. Yeah. I remember getting one last year and just, I just 
didn't quite pull the trigger on it, but I just wasn't sure. But that was when I was having a lot of issues with my trolling motor constantly getting out of balance. And this, I had other issues going on, but yeah, you know, we finally yeah. figured that all out. But yeah, I bought it long before it was at TH Marine. So I kind of was doing it because the idea of being able to get it off real fast. And it was a guy who had a small company. I was like, well, he's a machinist trying to make an extra buck. I'll spend another 10 bucks or whatever it was to, to buy it. So, and it's kind of like my motor stop, right? They're, Unless you drop it in the lake or somebody steals it, you ain't going to ever wear it out. So you can move it from boat to boat, you know, whatever. Yeah, that you know thing's super saying? solid, man. That's made that thing's made really, really good. Um, yeah, it's like machine water, aluminum. Yeah, it's stout. Um, Small water charter says he has the Ultera and it's the auto stow and deploy. And then he also says the TH Marine stabilizer and that does help. We could tell. Yeah, I, I would probably say it does. Yeah. Okay. Let me think about it. You know, it makes sense. Uh, well, and it, does, it does double as a weapon if you had to unscrew it and beat somebody with it, like Gabe was saying. That it's kind of pointy. You know, I'll tell you what, two years ago, <laughs> I went, went down to uh, look at the Ozark for a classic, and my trolling motor, the I spun the, the pin on it. And I tell you what, I had played a hell of a time trying to get that nut off the back of there. That the very end of it, I guess, got chewed up, and I couldn't mm -hmm. stick anything in there to hold the, the actual shaft straight. So I was just spending the whole thing the whole time. And I tell you what, it was, I spent probably a good four hours working on that thing before I got it off. Right. Well, like I said, I'm pretty anal about that. I taking that off and looking same way with my prop, every couple of trips, I'll pull it off and look and see what things are looking like in there. Catch any, you know, I think I found it one time I found fishing line, but other than that, it's always been a, a good thing. Didn't find any problems. So, uh, you get some good catfish line in there. It's oh, nice. geez. Yeah. There's some braid. Yeah. Yep. You'll know that probably, probably right away if you get braid in there, probably. Never yeah. had that, but I imagine it doesn't melt down like the monofilament and fluorocarbon does. It, it was anymore. There's not a whole lot of monofilament out there, is there? I mean, in comparison, I'd have to say it's got to be half of what. It used to be. It I know Ron used. still uses on his uses monofilament on his jerk bait. He yeah. told me that. Yeah. So does Marcus. Holders, but yeah, I still use it on a few things. I've dropped the pin several times. Or actually, here's a little story for you, smaller charters. Charters. Uh, I was fishing grassy, little grassy, probably like two or three years ago, and uh, drove all the way over there. It's about an hour and twenty minute trip, and then you got to go to the wildlife refuge, which adds another. 15, 20 minutes and you got to get a $2 parking pass and then you drive back to the lake. So I dumped my boat in, I got all my stuff ready to rock and roll. And this is, um, I think this is before YouTube. So I make a run all the way down the lake. I pull up to this point, put my troll motor down and I push the button, you know, and I'm not moving. The wind's kind of blowing the nose of the boat around <laughs> the end. And I'm like, okay, wait, is, is it on? I checked everything, you know? So I pull my, Long story short, I pull it up and my uh, the pin came out and the prop was completely gone. So I ran up to this little marina. They got this little podunk marina up there, and it was a uh, it was a min coat. No, it was a it was a motor guy. I had a motor guy. So I go in there and they've got a they got one prop in there, and it fits a min coda. It's the only one they got. So I bought it anyway, <laughs> just because. And of course, it didn't work. But yeah, so. Always Zip ties and duct tape, you couldn't even make it work, huh? Yeah, yeah I know, man. I don't think I had, I had black tape. I do know that, but I couldn't figure it out. Um, so, yeah, now I got an extra prop in the boat at all times because that's stupid. You make that long drive. and No and more did, than I they cost. Fish, man. I had to turn around and go all the way back home. You know? Yeah, yeah that's what I was going to say about those pins, too. 153 of those doesn't weigh as much as one half-ounce tungsten. So take you 20 of them and wrap a piece of painter's tape on it and throw it in your terminal tackle box and you'll always have a bunch of those pins for your trolling motor you know yeah you, never, you might right. leave without your jerk baits you might leave without your spinner baits but you're not going anywhere without your terminal tackle box so you'll always have them with you if you throw them in that i had it over crab orchard fishing the dam over there one time it was windy that's where it went out on me i caught it was catfish trout line caught it in there and it ripped it right out like it was nothing oh, yeah and it was windy so i kept starting i was by myself kept starting the boat running out a little bit go up there and work on it Get back in there, start again, run back out. It just kept blowing me in there. But yeah, I'm always, I'm always, uh, I get freaked out by, you know, people that run those jug lines 
and you're, oh, yeah. you're idling, you're looking at your graph, you're looking at your down scan, you're idling, you know, you, <laughs> the next thing you know, you look up and you're right in the middle of this flotilla of like bright yeah. yellow jugs. And those uh, guys got, more, apparently those guys got contour maps too, huh? They're putting where you're looking. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> bass and crappie or, or bass and crappie yeah. and all that. They're all in the same areas a lot of times. So Dave Helmer made a good point and that reminded me of something. He said the shanks on a flipping hook work good for pins. Takes two, but they work in a pinch. That's funny you said it because I've used the end of my bungee cord. It worked perfect, fit right in. Well, I, it was funny you were saying that, Gabe, earlier. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh. it worked perfect. Yeah. Okay. When you were talking about that break and that prop, I was I was thinking to myself, there's two friends of mine that I would want in the boat when that happened. That was Dave Holm <laughs> and uh, my buddy Luke's a mechanical engineer. That dude can fix about anything. So you just get well, he don't chew anymore, but you just give him a dip and he'll sit down and figure it out. But but Dave's MacGyver up for as long as a day. I mean, he's got some crazy ideas for lures he's been monkeying with and stuff. But Dave's always monkeying around with something. He's a he's a he's always tinkering, and his kid's always killing giant deer. He's got his kid is just slaughtering giant deer. You have to ask him about what the size. I don't know anything about how. You, all I know is when I look at the picture, I'm like, good lord. There's some there's some big deer over there in Illinois. Yeah. I know we had a uh, Lucas Stell on here. Um, yeah. It's been several, three, four, five weeks ago, but yeah. man, he had some heads on the wall behind him. I mean, some. Oh yeah, heads. yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, well, he Dave's, got, Dave's all bow all the time. Him and his bow. Well, him and his bow uh, boys. So, I'm not to me, I, I really appreciate that more. You can get them close enough to. No offense to you, Missouri guys, dropping them with a 300 wind mag, but getting them close enough to kill with a bow is a whole nother level, I think. Coming from the guy that doesn't deer hunt, but you know, it just yeah. seems that way. I'm I always tell Dave if he needs to take a knife in his teeth and jump out of the tree, he's mean enough. Just slit one's throat. <laughs> yeah, I'm. The, I don't. You're not a deer hunter either, right? No, I used no. to deer hunt, man. I, I I'm a deer eater, hunt. though, man. I love it when people give yeah. me the meat. I love eating it. Yeah, I'm the same way. I just. I just they look too much like Simon. That's why I can't shoot him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I don't hunt anymore. I used to hunt, um, and the place I had about 250 acres. It was private. And nobody lived out there at all. There was some, there were some big deer running around there too. And the guy that let me hunt there, his sister decided to build a house up there. And she was freaked out about any kind of guns, any kind of bow hunting or anything. And then I lost all yeah. my privileges <laughs> after that. So I got booted out, man. But after that, I just kind of gave it up. I just fish all the time. But I did, I, I did bow hunt quite a bit. Never shot a deer, never shot um, a turkey with a bow. I seen, I had my, I had chances. I had chances. I remember one time I was, it was, uh, I was out in the woods and I was tired, you know, I was like bright eyed and bushy tailed till about 10 o'clock and, uh, I was bow hunting and I was leaning up against this huge lay down. This is a big old oak tree laying down in the woods, had my back against it. And I decided to just kind of lay down and take a nap in the woods. So I'm laying down <laughs> uh, 30 minutes later, 45 minutes later, I hear some walking in the leaves on the other side of this big lay down. And uh, so I opened my eyes and I kind of kind of rolled back and looked up. And I mean, not even five, 10 yards on the other side of that. I seen this head. It was, it was a guy, it was a turkey. I could <laughs> see the top of his head just doing this. And, you know, I mean, there's no chance of me standing up and yeah. drawing back on a turkey. But I just, so I just laid there and watched them go by. There was like three or four of them. But I was that close. <laughs> Hell bass is on. So the nap sounds awesome right now. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, dude. Yeah. I'm feeling it, man. Speaking of which, sleeping real is nice having you in here. I know you're getting ready for your show. I'm uh, not seeing the comments. Oh, never mind. I'm in private chat. I'm on it now. <laughs> I see problems over here too. Yeah, fish no nap for me. Okay. I just had a big cup of black rifle coffee before we got on here. So yeah, I figured uh, Sophia would be on here, but she'll be on later probably. Yeah. Make sure she ain't sick of deer meat yet. I think one of the high school boys that I uh, help out with is going to get on here tonight. I don't see him on there just yet. We got to tell the story about before we forget. We don't have to do it right now, but let's try to remember. Um, Dave told me to make sure I asked you about the dead man's hole. <laughs> you know, you know yeah. anything about the dead man's hole? I do know all about the dead man's hole. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, too many people know about it now. But, uh, yeah, we can either talk about it now or we can talk about it later. We won't forget, that's for sure. Hank wants to know I, what you're drinking. I'm, I'm going to say Knob Creek there. 
go. My neighbor bought me this for Christmas. It's not even Christmas. It's almost gone. But uh, I was gonna say a stocking stuffer, but it's too big to fit the stocking. Oh, we'll make the stocking bigger, bigger if we have to. That's true. <laughs> but you, you've met my neighbor Marnie. She's the gal that's got the Doberman across the street. So our dogs are buddies. Yeah. So uh, yeah, she helps us out a lot. So we uh, <clears throat> she's one of the good neighbors to have for sure. You got some good neighbors. Oh, I do. I guess got a gold yeah. medal. I got Olympic gold medal neighbor. I got Marnie across the street. Now, do you now not to get specific or nothing? You live in Arnold area, right? Mm -mm. No. Okay. I'm a Fenton. I uh, can't say I won't cuss. I'm a Fenton fudge head. I got you. Living Fenton. Yeah. You get off at Arnold. Yeah. Oh, I, I know that. 141. I grew up 141 straight up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm from Alton originally. I'm an Alton boy. Well, Hillsborough, Illinois originally. So I fished all those. When your one guest that had all the deer heads was, it really reminded me of the old Red Man's. I used to be at all those tournaments uh, back in the day in Illinois, Wren, Carlisle, Shelbyville. My, I wasn't fishing them. My stepdad was. And then when I got old enough to start fishing some of them with him, I did. But uh, that's kind of how I got started fishing was following him around at those Red Man series back in the day, which I wow. guess history right there, that's what became the BFL. That's now the MLF that whatever. Yeah, However, right. that all went down, but <clears throat> okay, that was yeah. good old days. I got another Dave Holmes story for you, though. Dave could probably remember the time we got caught at Kincaid in a hellacious storm, and we beached the old SS Buck Nasty. I mean, we came in hot and just put it on the bank on that keel protector, and Dave was trying to climb in a rod box, and that wasn't working out. So uh, he just got up under the console. We both kind of got and he was in the passenger console. Because he didn't have rain gear. I did. I was more scared because I thought I was going to get hit with lightning. I got out of the boat and got up on the bank. And Dave sat there with the golden rule, just squeegeeing the water towards the drain to keep himself dry the whole time underneath the console. He got a little ball. <laughs> he stayed fairly dry. Yeah, I think he stripped down to just his, uh, just his skivvies. And uh, so his clothes didn't get wet through them in the dry box. And then he just sat up there and squeegeed the water towards the drain the whole time. You ever you ever had the you ever had the line raise up off the water? Oh, when you get like yeah, oh, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I've had that happen a couple times. I've, I've dropped my rod a couple times when it just I heard a buzz, like I felt yeah. something hurt a buzz. I just dropped the rod, and you know what I did after that? Went to the truck. The that's right. Out of me. I'm yeah. done. We were at I've done. been in a hurricane in the Virgin Islands, and uh, I said it then when I seen the first car going end over end down the street, I was like. I'm from Illinois, but I've had physics, dude, and a coconut at 110 mile an hour is a fucking cannonball. <laughs> I can tell you that. If it's throwing Jeeps down the street, it's slinging those coconuts around. You don't want to be out there dodging that shit. Yeah, stop, chop, so, and roll. I have a great yeah. respect for storms. I spent yeah, 22 yeah. hours without a roof getting poured on. So, yeah. yeah. That's yeah, crazy stuff. I've got – where did you say you were at when you got caught in that storm? You know, uh, with Dave? Yeah. The, yeah, that's right. So my brother and yeah. my brother in law, my brother and I, the first time we ever fished together, we were at Kincaid and got caught in a major storm over there. And I don't know if you know where the picnic area is at. Oh yeah. But we come around, we come around that and it's a, you know, no wake in there. But at that point I didn't care. We we dodged in there, got up in there, and they have got an old uh uh not an outhouse, but kind of like a bathroom deal up there, a little shack or whatever. Right. We ran to that thing, and I'm telling you, you could hear trees getting hit with lightning around us the whole time. And I mean, it was, I, yeah. I was not done with that. But can they, you, yeah, that's that scary stuff. Scary stuff. Yeah, the violent ones usually aren't, you know, long, the violent part of it anywhere. But man, when it, when it, when you get right in the middle of it, I guarantee if it would have, you know, you'd have had the radar, you were, you were in the bright red or orange or whatever the heck it is, went yeah. right over where you were. Yeah, we were. Fishing out yeah. on my buddy's boat, he had a little 16 foot. Uh, I don't even know what kind of he, some. It was a boat he rebuilt. It caught on fire and he rebuilt the whole thing. It was like an old. I don't even know what. To, maybe an old. I don't even know what the hell it was. It was a fiberglass. Skinny, that. Yeah, it's fiberglass. Hydrosport. They were kind of skinny. It, it might be. I don't know. It was a small boat. I can tell you that. Yeah, yeah. We, had, uh, we, we were at we were at Duck Creek in that we're talking about the static electricity in the air. And I remember us fishing with my buddy Alan. I think we were fishing a little club tournament and Duck Creek's a real shallow lake. It's four or five foot deep. Um, it's got cypress knees and cypress trees and grass. And it's got a lot of broken off stumps just kind of scattered underneath the water all over the lake. 
So there ain't no running out of there. No, well, yeah, there was that day because <laughs> I, uh, my rod started vibrating like you were saying. It started humming, making a little humming noise, and and I made a cast, and my line just never really sat on the water. I mean, it was just kind of kept it up. It was whatever creepy, dude. And then we heard pow off in the distance, and we put that sucker up on pad. We hit a couple couple stumps you know the nice thing about having a nine nine motor is it kicks up automatically <laughs> so we just you know you just do this and you just keep on going and we got to there's there's a little set of slips on that lake and we just hightailed it to those and, and just ducked in but man that was so scary and then and then here comes the rain and then the lightning's crashing and you're in this little basically it's like a like a six six it's probably two six stall docks is all you're tucked into so you got to figure out which way the rain's coming in and get on that opposite side and just ride it. Right. That's sketchy, dude. It is super sketchy out there. When I have so have either one of you guys ever been to Okeechobee? Never. Never have. Nope. So imagine this. You know how big it is and open and what's the only lake you can see from outer space or natural lake besides the Great Lakes? Uh, imagine that. When you get in a lightning storm there and you're the highest point from a long ways. Yeah. Along. You know, water <laughs> seeks its own level. So if you're Gabe, you're what six three, six four? I'm not that tall, man. Really? Six I'm, just, I'm just that short. He's tall anyway, enough to stand next to him. <laughs> God, I, I try to tell myself you're six three because every time I look at that picture of me and you at the Toyota tournament, I'm like, man, I'm little. Uh, I had my platform shoes on. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have my slips in. <laughs> but but to think about that, dude. Okay, I'm five ten and a half ish. I'm still the longest thing for a long way away. If you're anywhere. If you're a couple miles from the shore. Yeah. If you got a rod in the air. Too. Yeah. So, yeah, the all, all right. that, you yeah. know. Small water, that's, he, he said he lives. He lives on Okeechobee. So, he knows all about those storms down there. Yeah, that's that's some scary stuff, you yeah, know. Yeah, you got nowhere to run there. Yeah. Brian had asked that question about uh, a 1448, if it's a stable boat. Yeah. Um, Ron still told him if he was, if he was young. <laughs> he was young. Yeah, I had a 1442, and – it was a little bit sketchy. In fact, I, the guy I sold it to, um, he's wanting to go ahead and get rid of it because he's an older gentleman and it's just a little bit too squirrely for him. But I fished out of that boat. I mean, you've, you've seen some of my earlier videos. That's the boat I had. Um, but a 1448 is, you know, I, I wouldn't probably go smaller than a 1448 unless unless you're young and you're nimble and all that. Um, you, you can do the, you know, the 1442, but the 1448, I bought a 1650. I know Ron's got a, I think a 1650 two maybe 54 but if i was going to get a new aluminum boat and i had the money i would definitely be shopping for that 16 50 52 54 something like that you just got a lot you can handle bigger water better yeah. it's a lot more stable platform it's it's night and day difference just yeah when, two when you're saying squirrely gabe do you mean when you're fishing you could throw yourself in the water pretty easy yeah you had to i mean i got pretty good center of balance um but if you got Say, for instance, if the wind's blowing a little bit and you're fishing in some standing timber and you hit like a stump with the trolling motor and it stops you, you don't have a lot of room for air before you would step off the side. I, I never did. I did. I did bend a handle on one of my reels one time. Stop oh, because you arm. didn't have a cooler in your way. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, man, I, you know, it's kind of like electronics. Get the get the biggest boat you can afford. Um, but yeah, to, in, to a point. Yeah, to a point. To a point. Sure. Um, but that's 1650. 1652 something like that man is ideal you got you got plenty of storage in there it it still it's got enough pad on it that it still runs good you know that's another thing with uh, different sizes of a boat um you would think that uh 1442 would run faster than a 1652 and sometimes they will if you've got the the big boat weighted too much but you've also got that that surface bigger area. surface area yeah there. It gets up on pad and it's it's almost a, a flush. So you got more boat and you're still able to run, you know, 20 plus miles an hour. Isn't that a lot of the strategy? No, I wouldn't say strategy, but doing the nine nine tournaments, I would think that I would want to minimize the amount of stuff I drag along. It ain't like I got 250 horses in a 20 foot boat. I can put whatever the hell I want in there. And instead of going 73, I'm going 71 or something. So I would think, you know, I would want to take like a co-angler style load of tackle every time I went out and not try to take the kitchen sink if in the tournament now practicing, you can do whatever you want, but yeah, Rick says, uh, hit that thumbs up for us guys. Appreciate that. It helps the channel grow. Yeah, yeah man. We, we, uh, 
me and my buddy Jerry that I tournament fish with, he um, he's got his tackle kind of dialed in. He's got it downsized. He just kind of brings what he needs. Um, and, and it, man, it makes a big difference. You know, like you just said, 50 pounds on a 10 horse motor versus 50 pounds on a 250 is huge. It'll, it'll slow you down, you know, um, a mile an hour, half mile an hour, something like that. Still Even there. the difference between a 150 and a, and a 250 is, you know, right. Yeah, tell Jerry to leave his sandwiches at home. Well, yeah. I mean, he, he kind of leaves his, his, he brings a smaller tackle box so he can make room for his five sandwiches. Cause, oh, well, that makes yeah, sense. He's got like 20 pounds of sandwiches in there. <laughs> man's got to eat man he catches fish when he when he stays uh uh fortified shoot yeah. greg will have five pounds of snickers you don't mess around greg never comes up short in the food department either i don't know about greg, greg is he can he can do either way i've seen him eat like a pig and i've seen him go all day without eating so i i'm usually chewing so i don't eat much i i gotta have, i gotta have my snack sticks usually yeah I have something snack. i can put in my pocket i do a lot of beef jerky yeah uh, I used to fry a bunch of bacon and just throw it in Ziploc bags and throw it in the cooler. You know, I, I send you the bacon that we made, but uh, I don't think it'd ever make it to you if I gave it to Gabe. <laughs> it is pretty good stuff. I'd have to freeze it. I'd have to freeze it and hide it in the back. Um, we got. Let's get. Let's catch up on some of these comments. Yeah. See if we missed anything. Before we get too far. I was talking about. They were fishing a tournament. And he said these two guys were still out there fishing all lightning and everything with the rod straight up in the air. Yeah, you know, no tournament is worth that. I mean, I guess I see a lot of the elite guys or, or the tour level guys fishing through storms, but you also well, that's see a different that. story. Yeah. A lot yeah. of them, and that's the younger crowd that hasn't been out there and seen enough of it. Yeah, uh, I, I guarantee you. Ask Mark Menendez; he'll tell you it ain't worth it. Or David Fritz. David Fritz has got a pretty scary story about getting. Yeah, started. guys that have been around a while or been in a serious storm. So I got a question that maybe I missed a couple of weeks ago and I just didn't know anything about it. And I was living in the dark, which is perfectly possible. Did something happen with the boat between Mark Menendez and Lucas Dell? With the boat? Yeah. Do you hear anything about that, Mike? I didn't. I've been kind of in the dark, man. I've been busy at work and just. I don't know. I didn't hear about that. Somebody at work. So I asked him, I said, hey, I said, do you watch the show with Mark Mendez on? And he's like, no, he goes, I really wanted to. I wanted to ask him about the boat with Lucas Dell. Evidently, I guess he borrowed his boat and tore it up or something. Oh. So, so it wasn't like a, wasn't like a, a bad thing. It was just an accident or something happened. I guess. I don't know. I didn't know anything about it. So Luke borrowed Mark's boat or vice versa? Mark borrowed Luke's boat. Oh, I'll have to ask him about that. I'll have to ask him I, about I that. I would have to say that. I don't think Mark Menendez has got a vindictive, vindictive bone in his body, so I'd have to say it was an accident. It was definitely an accident. You know, yeah, that dude, that dude is solid. He's he's having problems getting his boat. He's thinking he's going to have to fish out of a 2010 Skeeter. No, actually a 2000 Skeeter with a 2010 show on the back of it because his boat has not come in, and that's kind of weird. I mean, yeah, he'll he'll be fine. He'll be fine. He, right? Yeah, he's, he's still Mark Menendez. Is. It's kind of like Tiger Woods, like I said before, right? Picking up set of golf clubs at the yard sale on the way to the course and kicking the shit out of you with them. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Hendrix can make a pawn shop guitar sound like whatever he wants to make it yeah. sound like. Yeah. I like that. Uh, the, the bass player for Wolfpack, uh, Joe Dart, he came out with a custom series bass and it's got one knob on it. <laughs> I can't remember what song it was that Zach Wilde did in like a Walmart with a cell phone video playing like uh, a black Sabbath cover on a hello kitty guitar. <laughs> through a little amplifier and just tearing it up. Yeah. So, yeah, we've talked about that before, too, right? It's all right here. Yep. It's uh, five, ten secrets, uh, top ten yeah. secrets to guitar playing right there. Yeah. Uh, down the music road, my son, my middle son, Miles, he's taken to the LPs. And my friend Billy Hirsch opened a record store back in Alton, and they are packed mostly with young people that are kind of infatuated with the albums, you know, guys in their – Late teens, early twenties. Yeah, what is what is with that? I've seen record or record players. I've kind of seen it coming, dude. Because I've seen it coming because these kids grew up listening to compressed MP3 files, and then they hear it on an album or a CD, and it blows their mind. Yeah, you know, my son was like, "It's like I got a new stereo when I gave him a CD." You know, I, he'd been listening to the Grateful Dead through Spotify or whatever format he uses. And then he heard it on CD, and I'm like, oh, yeah, Shakedown Street sounds a heck of a lot better on the original digitally remastered CD than it does on your compressed MP3 player. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. He goes, now, Dad, I understand why you gave me so much crap for having Bose headphones and listening to MP3s. I was like, I tried to tell you, dude, you don't need studio quality headphones to listen to compressed files. You know, I like I that. They look cool. I love but, that, that analog sound. Um, yeah. I like a little pop and a little hiss. It just sounds it, it's like the difference between a studio album and a live album. The um, sound when the album drops in a jukebox was always something I remember. <laughs> right. I don't know. What, hey. I, I think Hank's drunk tonight. Oh, we're going to do a Hello Kitty fishing pole challenge. That'd be awesome. Actually, I think I still got some. I got Barbie doll. I got two of the Barbie doll ones in the Might closet. limit your casting range for sure. I, it came with that Cajun red line on it. Yeah, that I can tell you. I've crap. got probably. That I'm stuff coils like a phone eight. cord. Yeah, probably six <laughs> yeah. to eight kid poles downstairs from yeah. all the kids. They, they come over all the time during the summer and leave their poles here all the time. Just over the years, we've collected a bunch of them. One of the funniest things I saw was uh, David Dudley. He was trying to catch a catfish with using his horse to reel it in. Did you ever see that episode? So, do what? Now? Yeah. So, so David Dudley's got a farm pond, right? So he takes a he takes some like forty pound line or something, and he's got a, a just a single hook, and he puts a piece of hot dog on there, I think, and he he does the little lasso thing, throws it out, and then he ties it to his horse, and he gets up on his horse, and when he gets a bite. He just, you know, hits his horse on the butt and the, the horse takes off and just rips this catfish up out of the pond. So he actually caught a catfish using his horse to set the hook. That's a lot of horsepower. <laughs> that's a lot of horsepower, man. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's that's pretty good. He, he, he dances to a different drummer for sure. He, he's very original. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, like his, I like his dance moves, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that. That, guy's, that guy's incredible, isn't he? Mike Picker has got a question. He says, what do you guys think about the Garmin live scope? Um, Mike's the I, dad of the, uh, of the kids that I help with the uh, high school fishing. Okay, cool. Yeah. He we're mentioned looking, we're looking to buy some new equipment. Yeah. You said it was Ronan. 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 Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. So Mike, what do you think about the Garmin live scope? I think it's outstanding. Uh, I think it has its place for sure. But I, I think I told Mike this, if I was trying to coach, looking through, a, you know, I coach, I don't coach, I help them a little bit, but I don't really have a high school team that I coach coach, but I've coached football and baseball and soccer. And uh, I would think, it's hard to say this, but I would, don't you think, Gabe, that it might take away from your learning how to catch bass if you had that? But then is that just me being an old fogey and looking at things the old way? I don't know. Uh, it's definitely got its place, but, uh, and, and I don't know that Garmin live scope is, I mean, I think they're all going to catch up eventually. You know, I think they're saying the new Laurent stuff's good. I think it's all going to get crazy good in the next three or four years or even less or all get, yeah. but I don't know, man, if I'm learning how to come up and go find fish, you know, didn't you didn't you talk about the video where Pang Rack chased around a crappie for like 25 minutes and finally caught it? Yep. I think you could lead yourself down the sight fishing rabbit hole sometimes with that. I, I think I see both sides to it there. Cause you I mean you look back, I mean, we're not old guys by any means. No, no, we're not ancient. But I mean, you know, we had hell I had an Atari, you know. All right. But I, I see, like, my kids now playing their games, and I, I sit down and try to play a racing game or something with them, and, I mean, they just make me look like a stupid fool. That's the only games I can win. I can't win any other game but racing games. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I look at them doing this, but you get a couple of young guys out there that are passionate about fishing to begin with, and they start off with some of these live scopes and stuff. That's true. That's they're, very true. They're going to get deadly. Yeah. And, and then he'll he'll learn faster than me when to use it and when not to use it maybe, you know. Uh, yeah. that's what, that's what Menendez was saying last week. We were talking about the same thing. And, and he says, when you first get it, the kind of ooh, ah factor is a little bit overwhelming. You're looking at the fish, you're, you know, you're just constantly focused and obsessed with it. But then after that all wears off, you kind of figure so out a little bit when, you know, you, you kind of work it into your game. When can you use it? I remember him saying that, um, when he saw fish suspended up in the, 
you know, like standing timber under the water, when he saw them up high, they were catchable. If he saw them down at the very base of the tree, they were not catchable or vice versa. But you start to apply that to your fishing game and then it becomes another tool. Yeah. Or you see four or five of them in a certain depth range. You can just say, all right, in standing timber, for example, I'm going to run. I got a square bill that runs five and a half feet. I'm going to run this by every tree, you know. Right. Yeah. Now, and then when you see one, maybe target that particular one. But until then, go back to your normal thing of putting your foot on the trolling motor and casting it every. Now that you've kind of established they're all at what at depth X, you know. So. I'm just curious. I haven't seen much on this, but I wonder how much the water clarity is going to have a lot to do with that. I don't if know. You get some good muddy water, water, you know, with a lot of sediment floating in it, you know, from rain or whatever just happened, maybe. I, I wonder if that's going to play a lot into that. I'm not yeah. sure. Well, it does, it, does, it does in the down imaging, right? So uh, right. I don't know why it wouldn't, but yeah. yeah. You can probably decrease. It's probably got a clutter setting and a sensitivity setting. You can, um, you know, decrease. Right. You're going to have to adjust it depending on, I'm sure. I'm yeah. talking about my butt because I don't have one, but it would make sense, right? You have to adjust the other one. So why wouldn't you have to adjust that one? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. It's different between Carlisle shallow and muddy and bull shoals clear and deep right it's gonna you're not gonna take those settings from one to the other yeah i, I think it's not gonna be major tweaks with today's electronic they're not gonna be major right i mean i i think the for me personally the application that i would like to use it in the most is uh chasing those suspended fish the schooling fish that are out there um, that, that this time of year with an a-rig yeah they come up or you or you side scan them and just find the bait and throw under them the bait's moving around a lot and you just don't know which way it goes. Um, you, and you have to get up on top of them or you have to fire up your motor and, you know, then you spook them. A lot of these lakes are so pressured that just firing up the motor kind of freaks the fish out. Um, but that, that, and then seeing how they react to what bait, you know, that you're throwing. Um, Cause you can't really tell the way, the way we get feedback on a bait is if we get a bite, right? You mean we fish? We fish. Okay. Um, if you've got, if you've got that live scope, you can tell if the fish are just swimming away from your jerk bait or swimming up to it and stopping. Maybe you need to change colors or change cadence. Yep. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's, but, but you can, you could definitely get hung up on it and spin your whole, you know, your whole. Or get trip. pissed and just throw a grenade in the, in the. In there the you water. go. Oh, yeah, now it's getting serious. Yeah. Yeah. Jay says you have to adjust it to every leg. Yeah, so that, that makes sense. I just, yeah, it makes sense. I wouldn't say every lake. I bet if you went from Bull Shoals to Table Rock to, you know, Norfolk, you wouldn't change it much. The same as if you went from Wren to Carlisle to the Mississippi River. Yeah. Those settings are going to be a lot closer. Eric, sure. can, can, Eric says it can be uh, very frustrating seeing them and watching them look at your bait and swim right away. Yeah, Eric, the only time I've really been behind him was um, Matt from Three Pound Fishing over at Lake Egypt. I, I got to jump in the boat with him, and he's a crappie fisherman. And we were just we were just pulling up and fishing piles. So basically, he had a 12-foot rod, and we were that close to the pile. And those crappie, it's the same thing you're just talking about. You drop it. We were fishing live bait. You know, We just had a, a minnow with a split shot rig, and you can drop that thing down there, and you can see those crappie come up to it. And it would actually blend, and you're waiting for a little tick, and then they would just back off and swim away. That's a live off, bait. Off a of live bait? That's a live bait. Yep. You know, mm. Gary made a pretty good point, and I, I can definitely see this happening. He said pretty soon you're going to see underwater drones with sonar and remote. I can definitely see that coming. Now, that would be great for mat fishing. I would love to have a little submarine with a camera that would, like, glide up underneath. Scuba the Steve. Going on. Send I mean, Scuba Steve down there from yeah, uh, what was it? I'm all about that. <laughs> what movie was that? You go down there and go to Kincaid and swim with the muskie. Shoot, man! You'll be the next. You'll be the next one on uh, what is that? River monsters. Yeah, yeah. That's that's. Uh, got to eaten by something. By something. Let's figure out what it was. No, I'm staying in the boat, man. I'm just <laughs> staying in the boat. Yeah, there's catfish big, and you wouldn't catch me doing that stuff, man. Scooping down around the in the Mississippi or Ohio River around the dams. Screw no, that! You're nuts, man. It's a man eating catfish down there. Yeah. Somebody I, says they went to Pink Floyd concert on their honeymoon in 88. Yeah, it was small water, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, nice. But that was a pretty good show. Yeah, that's a woman there. Yeah, I seen Pink I seen the original Pink Floyd still had their original lineup in 86 at the old Checker Dome. Yeah. I and I looked at my Roger Waters ticket from like 
right when my nephew got back from Afghanistan, me and him went to Roger Waters. So I'm just seeing one member of Pink Floyd, and that ticket was 115 bucks. The one from 1986 was like 1250 to see the original band. So. Morrison said, said, I'm Jeremy Wade. <laughs> you can have him, man. I would not. Well, you know what? I'm going to get some form of that live scope, whether it's whether it's live scope or my next book, for sure. I'm going to have live scope or I'm going to wait and see what Hummingbird's deal is. Yeah. It looks good. I mean, that Laurent stuff looks really, really good. I've been watching some of the videos and it's it's amazing. Of course, a lot of the videos I was been watching, you know, you got a five foot fish like a sturgeon. So you really got a good palate there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See the, you can see the tail action. It's I've seen somebody posted one the other day on a, I don't know if it's a pike or a muskie or something like that. You could really see it. That was pretty neat. Yeah, it's pretty fluid. Remember, stuff. you could read the T on Bill Dance's hat when he fell in the lake and yeah. gave away on the commercial when the game warden came around. <laughs> I saw the, I can't remember what I was watching, but there was a guy that they did, they had a diver go down. Um, scuba diver go down in a lake and stand on the bottom like this. And the dude went by with uh, the side scan. I think it was a side scan. And you could see it little, looked like a little black cross there on the bottom. There was a diver down there. It was pretty impressive. I, yeah, think, it was, my, I think it was Hummingbird 360 side. Or not my, 360, but, but the, oh, I think, I think I, you know, you guys asked me last time, and now I've had more time to deal with it. I, I, I like my Hummingbird side, the side imaging on the Hummingbird better than I, better than the Lorantz. It's but now, granted, I haven't had the new Lorenz. So, uh, and the one thing I've liked about the Hummingbird so far too is, it seems like if they come out with a new side with that, that they're supposedly have hearing, they're going to come out with the front looking sonar too, and you're not going to have to go buy a new unit. It'll work with your Solix or your Helix. You won't have to get a special unit. So, to me, that's that's a big deal for guys that like already have a nice twelve inch Solix or something. And they want to get right. forward looking. They don't have to go buy. You know, same way with their 360. You plug it in, it works with either one. Right. Yeah. Like Smallwater said, the gator would eat the drone or the diver, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's always yeah. the question. You know, do do you get 360 or do you get forward facing, forward looking sonar? But Hummingbird, you can have both of it on on the same unit, which is pretty cool. So if you already got Hummingbird, you know that's the way to go. Well, but, and the the uh, the new Lorance does that too, right? Right. And, and, I don't know. For I sure. thought it, it all had to do with how you want your transducer, and they were selling a bracket that would flip that transducer for you. Maybe, Maybe yeah. Because right. yes, I just been watching the videos. I haven't read all the yeah. details on it. Um, I forgot who who we have on here that was talking about us, talking about us, talking to us about that. Because that's the video I wasn't seen. Because he posted a video on there, and it was showing that to where it would one way on your on your transducer mounting it on the bottom of your on your bottom of your trolling motor. Or you Versus on the it. shaft. Yeah, you can do it on the shaft, and then it changes. You said shaft. Yes. <laughs> well, all I know is I'm kind of a fanboy, but Marcus Sakura won another tournament at Lake of the Ozarks, and he just runs a 360. So uh, apparently you can still catch fish without it. Yeah, I think Polinick does pretty good with it, too. Yeah. Uh, so Small and, and like I said, Marcus is so familiar with all that hummingbird stuff been using. He doesn't even go to the Solux. He still uses the Helix because he's just more familiar with it. And, you know, that's what I'm going to do. If I ended up staying with Hummingbird, I'll probably go with the 360 and wait for their fronts only to come out. I don't know if that will even be necessary. I'll wait till I just think it'd be kind of weird to have like three Hummingbirds and a, then have to add a Garmin. Right. I mean, I know lots of plenty of guys do it. I mean, but and didn't you didn't Pete have it when you fish with Pete, too? Yeah. Yep. So yeah, you've been in the boat with him before, and he was throwing that a rig up and over the the treetops, right? Like being able to see, make sure he wasn't getting hung up as he was bringing it over. Yeah, man, he had that being a huge advantage. He had that thing dialed in. We're out there at Table Rock, and we're the boat's in like forty, and we're fishing trees that are topped out in about twenty, and he's making a cast with that a rig and with, with his live scope, and he's watching that a rig fall down, and when it gets to the depth, he just starts cranking it in, and it it's literally like a foot above those treetops and those spots were coming up and grabbing it. He saw every fish that he caught and I was trying to do the same thing and I was getting hung up because I couldn't see where I was casting that. It's frustrating. Yeah. Let's keep in mind who we're talking about too, though. I mean, I'm saying a dollar to a dog turd in 2019, Pete could have done the same thing because he spent so much time on that lake that he probably could have cast. He's probably casted those same trees and not got hung up for the last 10 years. 
Yeah, that's not the first fish he caught out of those things. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. So um, it wasn't like putting me up there on day one. I'd still be getting hung up and cussing and grabbing a jig because my stupid Alabama rig's hung up in that tree. Here you go, Mike. Here, here's a question for you from, from Mike. He says, uh, how how big, huh? That's Ronan. Oh, how he, big of a difference does the hydro wave make? Now, you've ran I a hydro think, wave for a while. I've had one since I could, I don't know, a couple of years after they came out. I, I think it's camouflage myself. I mean, I know it works because I've, I've told you, I think I told you guys this story when I was in that web tournament where we could launch from wherever we want, but you couldn't make your first cast. And I had a spot on a main leg dock that I knew they were there because I had reeled one up real slow on a jig with the hook turned down and, you know, it's table rock. So I seen four or five others that were equally as big as it. And it was a good solid three, four pounder. And there was like, seven, eight, nine, ten of them down there with it. So I get there in the morning and I'm sitting there sipping coffee and I look down and I got like seven minutes to go and I drive, take another swig of coffee and I think, oh, maybe I should turn my hydro wave on. Turn the hydro wave on. Shad started flickering, fish started schooling and I couldn't make a cast. I immediately <laughs> shut it off, but it already, the, the, the game was on and I had to sit there for six minutes watching fish bust all around me and couldn't make a cast. So I know I know it activates fish, uh, but I also think when you're just got the trolling motor on and you're moving down along docks, maybe just having that noise kind of camouflages your presence. Uh, but I know they're interested in it. I mean, I, I, it activates the bait. I, it's not like they're going to swim up and jump on your bait because it's there, but I don't think it hurts to get them in the right mood. It camos your presence. And also if Gabe has one, I'm going to get one because I don't want him having an advantage. So <laughs> Did, didn't you say it attracts turtles too? Oh yeah. I've had turtles swim up like three of them just staring at the speaker. Like, Hey, I heard there's some bait getting ate over here. We're looking for some scraps. What's going on? You know, that's kind of what they, that's what their eyes said. They didn't really say that, but that's kind of what they said. It was like, Hey, it sounded like there's bait getting eaten over here. Yeah, you know, Smallwater said he swears he catches more fish with the radio on in the boat. He said ten boat vibrates. Bass love Southern Rock. No, they love they love uh, Romstein. When I was fishing with Kelly Jordan, we were in a little backwater, and he started blaring Romstein and throwing a square bill and called every fish in the live well. And he said, "I told you these Fort. What where were we at? Fort Collins? No. What is it up on the Mississippi River? Gabe, help me out. Fort something or other." Forget no, that's in Oklahoma. No, that skips. That skips. It's in anyway. It was up on the Mississippi River in Iowa somewhere, and uh, he's he told when he flipped the fifth one in to call his fifth fish, he was like, "I told you these fish were Nazis. They love the Romstein because <laughs> he had the Romstein just blaring." Man, we've caught fish out. Of, we've caught good fish out of your boat with the radio going. You know, mm -hmm. that's the, before I started doing the the YouTube stuff with and being in the boat with Mike. We, we had to turn it off because of the YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, you get copyright violation if you got any kind of radio. Oh going. yeah. But, but yeah, we used to catch them. I don't think it bothers them too much. Yeah, um, they're all safe. Um, no, I mean, especially like in the Ozarks. You know, they, it's not like it's there's a radio on every other dock and oof, 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 going by all the time in those big boats. So. I don't think it bothers them. I think I told you guys this before. I was fishing brush piles in a tournament. I had one of them big boats come in and drop an anchor right in the middle of the brush pile. And then I kind of did one of these. And he looked at me. He's like, oh, were you fishing there? And I was like, you know, it's a popular spot where guy at the back of a cove and a flat where guys come back and park their boats. And I was like, I was, dude, but damage is done. I said, don't worry. As long as you guys are just going to sit there, I'm going to fish this other brush pile and give it 10 minutes and I'm going to come back over and Sure enough, I gave it 10 or 15 minutes and came back over and started catching them out of the same brush pile. Once that anchor hit bottom and everything settled down, they all came right back to that brush pile. Uh, and long, the funny thing of that is it was a super hot day and the old ranger didn't have that big of a cooler. And uh, I culled a couple fish and I had a couple that were looking rough and I was running out of ice and that guy loaned me a bag of ice. So, you know, pays not to go, well, what the shit, dude? What's your problem? You know, just be cool with the guy and then, you know, he gave you a bag of ice and kept my fish alive. So, you know, yeah, I think they're used to all that noise. I mean, I've caught, I've caught bass in Mississippi right off of idling barges. I, I, you know, that's a big V12 diesel with the pistons the size of a milk carton. You know, and those fish get used to that. You know, I think that that churning a little bit of that water and stuff is probably gets them fired up. Small, small water charters. 
Um, I saw what you said there. I got a little tip for you, man. It's something I kind of learned. I've done this a couple of times and it works pretty good. So if you've got some video footage and you got some kind of um, music in the background and Mike, I'm thinking of the Toyota owners tournament where they got the big Toyota truck with all the boom, all the speakers in it. Yeah. So you're talking to Matt Airy and you're talking to Ike and Ellie, but you got this uh, back in black in the background. Well, it's a copyright violation, right? So you, all you have to do is, Get some of the non-copyrighted music, the time, the stuff that's on the YouTube auto library and auto library, and you sync oh, that right. in with it, and it creates this like weird song that they can't quite pick up on it. So it's just kind oh, of cool. mumble jumbles that background yeah. music, and uh, and you'll be good to go. I've trust me, I've done that a couple times, and it works. Let's see, we were over Lake of Egypt this past summer, my wife and I, and I caught probably one of the nicest bass all day long on video. And she's got the radio on back there listening to whatever new pop song it was. Right. And I couldn't even, I'm like, I just had to mute it through the whole scene. <laughs> it was like, man, that sucks. Yeah. yeah. Those pop people will probably come after you. Listen to Ray Wiley Hubbard. He'd probably be like, yeah, I'm just glad people are listening to my music. They will let it slide. Yeah. They, uh, they won't, they'll give you a strike, but they won't pull your video down. You just can't right. get it monetized. Right. So, yeah. But it's um, you don't want to keep doing that. So it's not it's not the artist, Gabe. It's the channel. It's not to take the risk. Is that what it is? Well, um, I haven't really looked into it, but I've had that happen a couple times. And, and here's another thing: sometimes those free, uh, the non copyrighted music. Sometimes that artist, yeah. if they didn't sell the complete rights to YouTube, they'll come back and they'll decide to copyright something. I've had a video that was out for six or eight months it was fine no problem at all no strikes again against it and then all of a sudden i get a notice from youtube that says you've got a copyright violation on that video and i'm like really um so that person that artist went back and decided to copyright his music and yeah. you're and that song stuck in your video so you I always need to use something that that youtube owns or whatever your streaming service of non-copyrighted music whatever that yeah. is make sure that they own that music and the artist is not going to come back. Um, I'm all about giving props out to the artist for, for sure. Here's, a, here's a tip then don't use Bob Dylan. Cause if you just sold it to $310 million, I guarantee those people aren't going to let you use it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I can tell you, all of my videos, all the intros, that song that I've got in my intro that, are, well, Morrison's son, he's actually one to made the intro for me. And when he made it, it was fine, but now it's copyrighted. Really? Yeah. I'm going all tungsten groove. If I start videos, they won't sue me. I don't think. No, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Yeah. I, I was putting some of the stuff that I'm, that I did with them that was never like finalized into an album. That's some pretty good stuff. It's just some of the jams that um, when Stan and Brett and justice would come down to Jeremy's house and we just had, yeah, some I was listening to some of that the other night, the Monday night jam sessions. Yeah, man. Stan we used to record them and send them to me. There's some good stuff on there. We never really, we never, some of it's, Decent as it is, but we never went into the studio and actually find. No, it. but I, I have one. I think it was you singing "Comfortably Numb" in one of them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, we we got on that little kick. I had a couple of. I think songs. I got seven or eight of those on MP3 that Stan had sent me, because he was like, "You're gonna dig this," you know, and he was yeah. right. It was you guys covering like Voodoo, I think Little Wing, and maybe. Uh, Oh, what's the other Hendrix song that I'm thinking of? Uh, we did like Hey Joe, All Along the Watchtower. <laughs> All Along the Watchtower is one of them. There's another one, too, from Electra Ladyland. I can't oh, uh, uh, Little Wing. Yeah, yeah, Little. yeah. That's a fun song, man. I love that song. It's good stuff. What we yeah. got? Steve, do you see that comment on there? He says, wife walked in on me watching a 10 horse Monty video and based on the music, thought it was porn. <laughs> Dude, I don't know. I don't know. Hey, well, when in doubt, man, when in doubt, that stuff sells, you know? Hey, that's what I'm saying. It's creative and I'm separating myself from the other guys. Oh, you are. You know man. exactly what's going on. <laughs> it's yeah. not porn until you hear him say, I'm here to fix the plumbing. I like that groovy stuff, man. If it's got a fat bass line, it's really, really tight. There's a chance that I'm going to pull it out and drop it on one of my videos. I just, that just always attracts me. I like that. Yeah. I'm surprised you haven't just laid down some funky bass lines to all uh, Barney Miller style bass lines to put. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. It's good stuff, man. Tom said he fished night tournaments with dark side of the moon blaring and catching fish right and left. <laughs> nice. Nice. You can't go wrong with that. See, yeah, Whitewell made it in here. What's up, Whitewell? His channel channel's been doing pretty good. Yeah, I'm appreciate or I'm look liking the videos you're putting out there, man. Uh, DJ, yeah, DJ's uh he's a tungsten groove fan now. He uh 
Hard not to be. Yeah, he, he reached out uh, not too long ago. I think he asked you what song was on one of my videos, and it was The River and Me. The River and Me, yeah. Yeah, DJ, I played uh, I played with those guys off and on, and um, all those songs on that album are really, really fun to play. They're easy yeah. easy, easy to get into, easy to, to learn and work with. And you, play, you play with a lot of guys? I just play with a select few guys, yeah. Guys that are willing to be submissive. That's right. Guys that play well. Guys Don't that- let him kid you, though. Gabe could go play with them tomorrow. I remember, Gabe, one of my funniest Gabe stories is when you were telling me we were out fishing and you were like, I played at my church on Sunday and then I went to the winery and my first, the first song we played was, uh, I get stoned in the morning. I get- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a church gig in the morning, so I played the 930 service. <laughs> 30, we got out and at one o'clock I was at a winery and that was, <clears throat> that was the first song we played. So that's I why good, man. I was good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's what's wrong with me is I grew up listening to that stuff. I'd be riding to the duck blind or the bass club meeting with my stepdad at nine, singing, singing along with that, not knowing exactly what I'm saying, but yeah, all those old Charlie Daniels, yeah. Waylon Jennings songs. David, I appreciate that comment, man. He says he, he'd rather not have music really enjoy the fishing content and not a full production. That's, that's good to know, man. Cause I, I agree. agree. Some, some of the stuff I put, I put like a little short minute, or minute and a half, little just kind of clippy thing with some music in it, just to kind of yeah, a little bumper between segments. You gotta have something to edit with. Yeah, a lot of guys have the the music going in the background. You know, some people. Yeah, you don't want it the whole time. We all want to listen to the wave slap off the side of the boat. Yeah, I like the noise. Feel like you're there, right? Especially in a tin boat, you get that clunk 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 clunk. Speaking of which, we we're not taking the tin boat next week, and all. No, we'll be taking the the glass boat. Okay, the glass you boat. Taking the Ranger out. Uh, I haven't had it out. Ratio like, Ranger to aluminum. Yeah, I haven't had it out in like six months. The battery, I'm charging the batteries. You sure battery. I, I we probably need to go out there and I'll go out there and check it out first. We might fish a tournament. Um, yeah, next. dump some sea foam in it before you leave. You'll be good. Yeah, it's that's good. I I did do that. It's got ethanol free in there, and um, I put some. Uh, I think I put some seafoam in there, or some Lucas treatment. Whatever, or, yeah. As long as you do something. Or some water. Yeah. Take mine away after you. You know how we're always like precisionly measuring that, and putting it in, or whatever. I I went with him, my, my buddy Jason that owns Belleville Sports and has been a mechanic, and he was like, he just dumps a bunch in there. He's like, ah, you can't put too much. I mean, it's like shit. It'll, you could put four gallons of it in there, ain't going to hurt anything. So he's like, go heavy or go home. I was like, well, that's nice when you own the shop, but you can grab a hold of all that you need. Yeah. That stuff's the, you know, everybody back in the day used to talk about, oh, he didn't give me gas money or, you know, in the, your old club tournaments. I'm like, dude, when the synthetic oil is $48 a gallon, you should be giving me oil money. The gas is the cheap part. Yeah, no kidding. But uh, all the other stuff, the the mercury, add, I mean, I add that stuff to every single tank, uh, you know, and try to buy ethanol-free gas on top of it, even – you know, Gabe will tell you when we go to Table Rock, it sounds redundant, but I'll fill up at Hay Bob's on the way out if they're open because they got that ethanol free gas. And that old Ranger would get like two or three miles an hour better on top end with that gas, yeah, got, gas station. Yeah, we got we got two gas stations here in town where I live and, and they're both ethanol free. Yeah. So usually on tournament Saturday, stuff like that early in the morning or even Friday evening, you'll see everybody loaded up there. Yeah. Yeah, I just put straight. Uh, I just put straight gas in my in my little boat because I'm I'm using it every week. Yeah, you're gonna burn it out of there. You'll be fine. Yeah, it's it's not sitting for very long. You don't have to worry about that. But my other boat, I definitely put the ethanol free in there because it's been sitting for. Yeah, and just using the conditioner. If you use the, if I had a can of Starbright, I'd shape it. There you go, Luke Duncan. Come <laughs> on the show sometime. We got some, I mean, that's what we got to do. I should have brought a bottle of Starbright. Maybe we could get Luke to come on. Yeah, right. You don't need me help, man. He's he's shaking and shaking. No, man. And, and uh, speaking of theme, the music, I I love that. I mean, his music's pretty damn decent, man. And that 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 theme song he uses is pretty catchy. It gets yeah. in your head, man. It gets it's in your head. head. You're talking about he's, that last week or week before. Yeah, he's genius for singing along with it too. No, I have not. Yeah, it's uh, it's catchy for sure. Whitewell wants to know: Is anybody fishing with the warm weather? I went. I went today, man. It was. Uh, we were talking about it at the beginning of the show. Um, I struggled a little bit. I went over to Lake of Egypt, and um, that's how we got 
talking about the trolling motor, I need to upgrade my trolling motor because I just couldn't I couldn't stay out there. I had to fish some side stuff. Was it, was it windy? Yeah, it was ridiculous. Um, it was 20 mile an hour winds out there and I had to keep the trolling motor on about seven just to hold still and fishing deep. I'm fishing out there in about 30 foot of water and I just I couldn't do it. I'm sitting here whining and complaining. At least I got to go fishing. But yes, yeah, the first real problems you got. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's I, I'm sure you guys are crying out there for me. But. Yeah, I, I fought the urge to go to the Lake of the Ozarks all weekend because of the weather was going to be so nice. And my buddy Jimmy, I used to play hockey with, he's posting all these pictures of these giant crappie that he was catching. And I love the bass fish, but if somebody's on the crappie, I like crappie sandwiches too. So heck yeah, man. I'm okay with putting a bunch of those in my fridge. Clean all the crappie out of the pond you want. We should do that. Uh, That's what we need to do, Greg. We'll catch the crappie and then we'll eat them around the fire the next time having a Fire hey, crappie sandwich podcast. Time, we can do it. Like I'm I said, down. well, Gay's monetized, so we can we can still do, we can do the live from down there. Yeah, I there you go. Probably, now that I think about it, I got enough. I got plenty of Ethernet cable. We could run the whole computer down there. <laughs> we could. We could do a winter live stream down by the. No, pond. not winter. I'm <laughs> saying we wait till spring. <laughs> that way we can set where it's comfortable at least. Yeah, somebody was up there asking about how you break down Lake of the Ozarks. Um, Mike, you've been there a whole lot more than I have, but uh, don't, I, the thing I know about there and about any big lake is is moving around. If you're not getting bit in a certain section, yep. pick up the trolling motor and run five miles and start over. Yeah, I've said it before. If you got multiple days, you need to you know pick out something on a map with a big enough creek you like and just start in it. And if you know if you if you start getting some feedback and some bites in that area then you can pretty much duplicate that in uh, two or three miles each direction of you most likely. If you're not getting bitten at all, bit at all, and it's a struggle. Well then either put it on the trailer and go 15, 20 miles away or throw it up on pad and take off. And then I like to go into, like I've told you guys before, I like to go into a cove that I've, you know, and just act like there's a dam at the front of it and try to figure out what's going on in there. Cause there's a winning limit of fish and, every single mm -hmm. significant size at that lake. Uh, so My and that lake has a lot to do with, I'm not an expert at it. I hate to even say, but rock, the, the transitions between the big rock and the little rock, the pea gravel and the sand, you know, just depends on the time of year, but it, it's that there's so many docks. It's what's the, the, what's going on underneath those docks. And there's, you can say it's the brush piles, but those, there's brush piles everywhere down there. I mean, people are constantly planting them. Remember, I took pictures of that guy putting those beautiful state beds right across from Greg's uh, dock. There's yeah. a big old house there, Greg, that had never never had a dock. They didn't have a boat. House caught fire. Some of the people bought it, remodeled it, and now there's a giant dock there. But about two days before they put the dock, this little crappie fisherman planted like four or five really beautiful stake beds in there. And, Five days later, there was a giant dock sitting right on top of where he had planted them all. So, <laughs> Can't drill a hole in the dock now. Yeah, so th th there's brush everywhere down there. So to me, it's always that transition area, you know. And, and if you find that they're you're getting around the trunk rock on a 45 degrees, and it's you know just run around. The, the difference is if you're Marcus Sakura, there's 150 places within three miles that you know look just like this, and you can go to them. I'm slowly getting there more and more where I know, oh, you know, I know another spot very similar to this kind of thing. Once I do start getting some feedback. Uh, I was down Lake of the Ozarks here back in October, October. Yeah, October. And I tell you what, it was running laughing part of the day and I had nothing left. I fished just about every spot I had marked and ready to go to. And I went and fished a new area that I found that is very promising. But yeah. It's like you were saying, it's got a, it's a real steep drop. I mean, it's pretty nice, but yeah, there's lots of those places. I mean, that's the thing. It's so big. It is so big. There's, there's, if you just do enough looking around, if you get caught up in the rut of fishing the same areas all the time down there, you're missing a lot. Yeah. The next cove over to your favorite coast probably got some really cool breaks or rock transitions or, Oh, wow. Look at behind this this dock, there's all this brush and then there's a seawall there, you know, whatever the case may there, you just can't see it all. I mean, you, you just have to move around and look. Yeah. Uh, 
but 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 the basic thing is if you got a tournament you got a couple days to practice pick an area that the wind's blowing in and if you go in there and there's bait throw a gate in the front of it and just put the trolling motor down and fish the entire thing if you catch them two-thirds of the way back on pea gravel banks where there's kind of some mixed chunk rock in it or whatever i bet you you could go to this a cove or two away from that that's got the same situation and probably get some more bites yeah it's a very very patternable lake it's it's it really is and on top of that it's loaded with keepers so you know there's only the weird times in the fall where you go down there and catch lots and lots of shorts for the most time you catch keepers at lake of the ozarks the key is to win tournaments down there. you got to catch five of them that weigh 20 22 pounds yeah right especially if especially if if marcus is in there Right. Well, talking about tournaments, what um, have you figured out what you're going to do in 2021 as far as what you're going to do? I haven't 100 percent. I'm really leaning towards fishing the three Toyota series tournaments and and then probably fishing the team tournaments with Greg because I'm kind of committed to that. And then if time allows, I might fish uh, a couple of those solo tournaments there. I don't know if Webb's going to have his, but there's, you know, that Missouri so- Pro solo series uh, that has like a seven tournament season. I don't know if I could afford or or find the time to fish all seven of them, but uh, it's just something I like to do is fish by myself. So that's the way I'm leaning right now. Uh, Been studying the old brochure pretty heavy about, you know, whatever it is now the MLF owns it. And man, when you look at it, it's, you know, I'm really tempted to go down there and buy a new Camus boat at Boatworks. But then when I'm thinking about fishing this and you look at there's a $35,000 bonus, if you win a Toyota series in a Phoenix, makes me want to call Trey and say, hey, does Lewis Marine got any room for a pro yeah. staff guy? Or, you know, because all the bass boats anymore are pretty damn good. Uh, so I don't know. But that's that's what I'm leaning towards. And, and who knows? I might end up doing it out of the Nitro. I still got one year of the tournament rewards left on it. I like the boat. So who knows? You know, it's more of like a time thing. Like right now, it's damn near the next year, right? This first tournament, I think, is Lake of the Ozarks in Feb- early February. I don't know if I got time to get a new boat. Honestly, you know, because I guarantee you, when I put that nitro on up for sale, it's probably going to sell. Pretty. I only got seventy-two hours on it, so um, it'll probably go pretty quick. So I don't want to get caught without a boat. But when you think about that, you know, that's seventeen hundred dollars, and it's roughly. I'm ballparking. It's going to cost me nine thousand to ten thousand dollars in expenses and entry fees to fish those three Toyota series. So, you guys got to cash a check in one of them, don't you? Or yeah, two. yeah, that's a lot of money, man. It's a good experience, but you it's know, a great experience. Yeah, you got to look at it that way too. Uh, but even if I don't get any financial help, I'm still leaning that way. I'm not getting any younger, and I. Th- I'd really love to see how I stood up against those guys. You know, that's when I went down there and fished that web series. That's the whole reason I did that. You know, that was a step up from fishing. You know, that was $300 and you're fishing against studs, the Davis brothers, Marcus, Sikora, Brown, Algio, you know, the Gavro brothers, Pete winners, Eric Prey. you know, there's a, ha- there's a, there's a dozen of those guys that make their living fishing. So that's no joke. You're going to have to catch them, you know, that's why to this day, um, winning the boat was awesome. But winning Angler of the Year in that solo pro series to me was still the biggest achievement because doing it all season long and staying steady was a bigger deal than winning one three day tournament. Yeah, I, think, yeah, yeah. I won that boat. I qualified like 26th or something. I got in there, but I happened to get on them. You know, I won a tournament the weekend before and then that tournament. So I kind of landed on them and stayed on them. Uh, but staying on them at five different lakes is a whole different ball game that's a that's a to me that's more rewarding i i find pleasure in finding them and catching them versus winning one tournament you know if i could get second in five tournaments financially it's not smart versus winning one but it's more rewarding yeah well you, you can know, have- if, you, if you got second in every tournament you entered for a season or second and third but never won one well, that's a lot better than winning one and getting 72nd and another one and getting 25th and just out of the money. You know what I'm saying? It's it's harder to do. It really is. I think Angler of the Year and Bassmasters FLW 
to me, that should be a bigger payday than the classic, yeah. in my opinion. Mike, I'm going to throw that question up there for you real quick from Ronan. He says, do you think I should be a co-angler or a boater if I did a tournament on the Phoenix series? Oh, you be, you want to be a co-angler your first time out on that, I think. Definitely. That's I, a, do, I do. I would do that. If you're going to do the BFLs, which I think is what they're calling the Phoenix now, they're calling it the Phoenix now. I think you want to do one season as a co-angler at a minimum just to get your feet wet and get a feel for it. And you'll make friends and you'll know people. So then when you show up as a boater, you'll have a little support system there, guys that know you. And I mean, I think that's the best part about the co-angler format is the, the, the people you meet, the friends you make, you know, you see them at the ramp. You might not see them next year, but you'll see them two years later and they still remember you. Yeah. You know? That was the biggest thing for me. I remember Austin Ware, when he got in my boat, he was like, you won that boat in the solo. You know, he's like, I don't mean to be tooting my own, own horn, but I'm a pretty good fisherman. It's funny now because guys will immediately, when they draw you as a partner, they Google your name. They know everything about you as far as your tournaments before you step foot. Where before it used to be kind of a mystery. Yeah. Or else you drew a Pete Winters or a Marcus Secor or somebody that everybody knew. They know me by my shirt. Like I wore the same shirt all the time. They're like, oh, I know you. I've seen that oh, shirt before. One, yeah. yeah, no, was, I burnt that. <laughs> we had a bonfire. Well, they know, uh, man. You've been recognized for the from the channel quite a few times when I'm with you. So, yeah, I mean, it's fun, man. It's fun. It's but time. but I would fish it as a co. I mean, I when I decided I, want, I thought I wanted to become a touring pro, that's what I did. I went and fished. Well, I fished the opens as a co angler and the elites as a co angler. And then I marshaled four of them with the next year or five of them the next year. So, yeah, you learn a lot from, from back there watching guys. And, you know, in my case, I learned, holy shit, this is a lot of work. I don't know that this is what I want to do for a living. But Ronan's young enough. When you're a high school age guy and got the passion he's got, look at Jordan Lee and other guys like that, man. Not saying Ronan's the next Jordan Lee, but he could be. There's no freaking doubt. He's smart. He asked the right questions. Uh, and you don't have a mortgage yet. He's got a dad that's willing to support him and help him out to get him started, you know, steering him down the right path. It's no different than if your son wanted to be a plumber, you know, uh, Could, uh, it's a realistic, it's a realistic job. I mean, it really is with the high school. I mean, I was the nerd when I was little, cause I had things like this, which was when I was, uh, what is that? Your, that's a team Evernrood patch off the back of my bass club jacket back in when i was like 10 12 years old who signed and I went, bill dance bill dance nice bass wishes yeah Never heard so of when i uh i went to the bass university way back my father or stepfather took me all the way over to indiana from hillsboro and i got that sign on the you know it was back when you sewed all the patches on your bass club jacket i immediately got home and made my mom cut it off and frame it and then sew another team ever new patch onto the back of my jacket. But, <laughs> but back then it was kind of a nerdy thing. I mean, now there's a lot of kids, you know, you can go to college for Christ's sakes. Yeah, Trevor McKinney would head on. Right. Right. And, and so, and, and the knowledge is just out there and, and the, the YouTube, it's no different if you decide you wanted to play the guitar versus or bass fish right now versus 1982. How many times did you pick up the needle and move it back, Gabe, and listen to it again and pick it up and move it back and listen to it again when you're trying to learn something? You couldn't just go to YouTube and get the tablature and put it on a put it up. Oh, here's a section I'm struggling with. I'm going to put it on a 20 second loop and just keep listening to it. Mm -hmm. So you feed it into your brain. Yeah, that's what my son does. He's got a little deal that tells him, you know, what keys to hit and everything. Right. Or what note to hit. But yeah, so, I, was I mean, player, skip yeah. it, just holding that CD player and rewind. For wine. I was, I was, I'm not that old to where I had a record player, but I did have the CDs. Thanks. So, but uh, you can, uh, you can slow it down now too, right? I mean, that's the other thing. There's stuff out there you can slow it down. Yeah. So hey, let's I, 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 you learn so much from being a co angler. I, 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 whether it's at the BFL level or a club level, BFL levels, there's, it's a fine, it's a, it, it's a fine line, right? You can draw a guy that is an ass. And you don't learn a whole lot other than how to, I don't want to be an ass like that guy. Or you could draw me or Greg or Marcus. <laughs> Jay, Jay says he wants to find the old retro tournament jumpsuit. 
yeah. like they used to wear. Yeah, with the with the big Elvis belt, white belt, and all that. Yeah, big pimpins. Yeah, no. but I mean, you know what I'm saying, Gabe? You've had great guys, and I, I'd say it's it's eighty percent good guys, twenty percent bad guys, and it's usually that twenty percent. Let's whittle that down to the ten percent that are that are real jerks. The other ones are just jerks in training. But you, you go out there to learn. You go if if you have there's a mindset. If you have the right mindset, you'll usually go down the right path. Right. You go out there to learn. If I mean, if you get the opportunity, a lot of times um, you don't get quite as many opportunities as you are expecting. The guy's not taking you out to catch fish. He's the one that's put in the work. He spent the gas money. He's got the insurance on his boat and the yep. wear and tear and all that. And he's he gets first pick at everything. So as a co-angler, you got to wait for your opportunities. There'll be there'll be opportunities that come your way, and a lot of times. It's there is definitely an advantage to being a co-angler because you don't have to mess with the boat, especially on a windy day. You don't have to worry about any of the boat control. You can just get back there and, and fish. You can tie different colors, different baits, try different things, experiment and fish for different fish than what he is fishing for. If there's definitely a flipping bite, throw out on the other side. A lot of times in the spring when the fish are up shallow, there's a group of post or pre-spawners that are out there on that first drop. Um, you can, I've seen this in Kentucky Lake. A lot of times you pull in those little shallow pockets and you, everybody's looking at the bank. A lot of times you can throw right out in the middle of cove mm -hmm. and catch fish out there. They're sitting out there at eight or nine foot and the boaters up there fishing in like three or four foot. There's fish out there that are leaving the beds or on their way to the beds. So probably the biggest tip that I, that I would um, suggest is watch what your boater is doing and try to fish for the fish that, that he's not fishing. And you know, there's fish in all different um, levels of the water column too. There's fish on the bottom, there's suspended fish, and there's fish that may be up tighter and will actually come up for a top water. Um, if he's dragging a jig or something, throw a swim bait, throw a chatter bait, throw a spinner bait, you know, target those fish that are in that mid-level um, water column and re you respect your boater. Don't cast in front of him. Don't cast towards the front of the boat. You'll kind of work that out like the, the last tournament I fished down at Lake of the Ozarks, um, the guy I drew was fishing a crankbait. He was just throwing a square bill. We were real tight to the bank. I really didn't have much of a cast. He told me, go ahead and throw up here. After I've thrown at it, I don't want it anymore. You can go ahead. So we kind of had a little groove going. I mean, I was I was casting towards the front of the boat, not over his shoulder by any means, but I was still making a 45, and he was making his 45. So we were just treading, you know, treading You're 20 simple. feet behind his 45 or whatever. Right. And he was cool with that. So you gotta, you gotta ask him, Hey, do, do you mind if I make this cast right here? And if he's like, no, man, you're messing with my fish. Well, then you just adjust. But if he's like, yeah, that's fine. Then you just roll with it. So always, always ask the boater. Yeah. Um, and the if, reason that worked out, Gabe, is because you're a cool guy. Be cool with the dude from the get everything you can do to make his day more easy and relaxed you know, be there on time, you know, you know, if you know how to back a truck, help him out as much as you can, all that kind of stuff, just building the relationship with him right out of the gate. You know, I mean, some guys are unavoidably jack wagons, but most people aren't. And if you pull your weight early on, I mean, every time he swings on a fish, drop your rod and grab the net, that goes a long ways. And I don't think you can learn how to be a good boater or else you've been a co-angler. Right. Yeah. I, I would say yeah, I would also respect. if you get that. I you, treat mine with respect because I was one that w I w was one and I don't want, you know. Right. right. So if okay. you've never been a, if you've never done the co-angling thing, I don't think you'll be prepared to know how to treat your co-angler. Yeah. And, and the best thing that can happen if you draw a guy, if you get so-called a bad draw and he's running the bank with a square bill, the best thing that can happen is he catches 20 pounds as quick as possible. And then he'll relax a little bit and he'll give you some. And he's a happy man. Yes. So mm -hmm. you ready to go over there? Hey, we're gonna do a we're gonna do an unboxing, Mike. You up for that? I'm down. We got Morrison Sons custom baits. He sent us up a little you character. get done unboxing there, we'll unbox the little magic Black Friday yeah. box tray. Uh, tray. You got, you got some, yeah. We're gonna man, do all kinds he, of custom baits tonight, he, guys. He put out his jerk baits the other day, and when he did that ghost. Holy crap. Yeah. I will be getting some of those. Yeah, this was his Black Friday special. You bought 10. Like, I needed 10 more jerk baits. You got a free wake bait in the box. He's painting me up some, too. He's a little bit behind, but he's working on some. Uh, hey, uh, John, if you're on here. He's on. Okay, cool. We're going to 
we're going to open your baits and kind of show the colors. And I don't, we don't have the colors. So if you know, if you have a name for the colors that we're showing up, um, I want to pick a, showing, I want to pick a few of them out first. Okay. Well, <laughs> put, put the names of them on here. Cause, um, and let's see, you got scissors. It'd be a lot easier if you had some scissors. Oh, sure. I've got to do everything. Yeah. I was going to, I don't want to slice. What kind of redneck doesn't have a big knife in his pocket, Greg? That's what I, I want. I got a knife, man, but I don't want to cut. I don't want to slice his. Uh, Attaboy. Attaboy. Okay. The knife. I take that back. I'm sorry. I was just trying to make these packages look nice and neat. It's a dull knife, too. It probably is. I use it every day, man. <laughs> I got a better knife. I got an old, I got an I Army got Reserve Buck knife. I got it. I got it. A buddy of mine's a recruiter. He gave me a couple free knives, which is super handy. Hey, while we're while we're waiting for him, um, a little quick question: Are you a finesse jig guy or a full size jig guy in the winter time? Me? Yeah, I'm absolutely a finesse jig guy in the winter time. That's what I thought. Same here, man. I, I like the uh, I like the new kind of. Uh, the, the the half ounce round head, so it's still got a little bit of weight, but it's a really small skirt profile and hook. Yeah, and then I use a lot smaller, either a smaller chunk or a smaller beaver, or, or I don't necessarily use a smaller beaver, maybe just the smallest beaver, and then trim a little bit of it off. And so you're yeah. a fan of the sweet beaver. I am a fan of the sweet beaver. Hey, I, who I is? You, I'll tell you, man. Everything from the texture to the smell to the Right down to name, the, the colors. The names, the colors. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna I'm cut these part of the tramp stamp. <laughs> I'm gonna cut these open and uh have you uh you can talk about them or whatever. Uh, this see. is exciting. So so Morris and Sons makes pour some custom baits, and like we were saying earlier, he sent us this care package. I thought he was gonna send us like just like two packs of stuff. Well, he loaded, so. he loaded his up. So we're going to just I had to uh, zoom in so I can see better. There we go. I'll show you what he sent us. Oh, I can tell you, this is the first one. That's one of this crawls right there. That's like oh, a punch yeah. crawl. Yeah. It's got a real slender body. Perfect for punching, going through grass, stuff like that. That's going to be Hey, really man, good. you trip that top part off. would be perfect for a finesse jig in the winter with those legs, too. Yes. Yeah. And, and actually, if you look at that, he's... He made it just right for you. Can, you can cut whatever you want off the top there. And yeah, top if you cut that right above those, right below those top appendages, it'd be perfect for a small finesse jig, yeah. probably. And that's kind of a, I wouldn't say that's a June bug color, but it's a almost like a hematoma. In, uh, yeah. So I'm yeah. eat beavers. Yeah, you're going to make me all greasy. Yeah, you're getting all greasy. Was it, all, squir yeah, it was yeah. like a squirrel of a black and blue, wasn't it? Like a squirrel yeah. black and blue. Yeah, and his baits come with plenty of, plenty of oil with them, trust me. They're well worth it there. So this is another one of his crawls. This is you're talking about the trailer for the jig. That is a oh, that's 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 yeah. Uh, that's 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 definitely nice. That's that's close to that yum that I throw that style. Yeah. There's, oh yeah, and it's got those big flappers, the the yeah. little ridges on the flappers. Yeah. yeah, I might have to get a hold of a couple of bags of that. Does yeah. he have green pumpkin purple? Oh, he can make, he can make it. People want to know. Yeah. Oh, he can. Oh, well, you're gonna have to get me this guy's number then. He's right. He's right there. He's last one to comment. Morrison Sun Custom Baits. I can see a bunch of those last ones you just put up there in green pumpkin purple. Now we don't need to show these. You got to show it, man. You got to show it. We don't hide nothing on this show. Greg's got a custom color, and he's scared to. He's scared to show it. So here, I'll show you this side. <laughs> that's a two-sided bait, man. No, that's the only side it is. Yeah. Oh, he's got laminate stuff, huh? Both it's double side action. Oh. So I will say the story behind this is, is I was kind of telling Gabe that's that particular color I've been throwing all year long. And I've had phenomenal luck with it. And that's in clear water to dirty water. That's crawfish uh, on one side, shad on the other. That's what yeah. I see. Right. That's why I like that peanut butter and smoke that's got that. Streak like of business silver in, in the back. Yeah, yeah it's a, the mullet of trailers. I've had a lot of good luck with that color on the back of a swim jig too. So I could believe that. Um, this is another one of his two color parts here. So uh, another one of punch crawls, that real bright blue like that. And so if, if you, oh, oh. old flake. That, you guys that are is that like a green pumpkin with gold. Is that what that is? Yeah, that's yep. pretty sexy, dude. I like that. That's that very nice. 
It reminds me of the BB Cricket by Gambler. We'll have to see if he can. I, I'm tired of spending the time dipping my tip chartreuse. Why doesn't somebody just make them where the tips are already chartreuse? So I don't have to monkey with that. And knock the whole claw. Yeah. Just yeah, the we'll tip. Go. I just want the tips. Yeah, just the tip. That's all you need. That's what she said. Yep. So here's more of a beaver style bait he's got. And these do have the big flanges on them. This is a really, it's really like one of the havoc baits. I mean, just yeah, it does look like it. Good I like that. Bait. Yeah. Like I said, it does have the bigger flanges on there. Yeah. So. See, if you could just do the flange and maybe an eighth of an inch up on their chartreuse, well, then you're in high cotton for sure. Yeah, it's kind of like a spicy beaver. Then at the end of the day, my tips of my fingers don't have to be chartreuse from all the <laughs> scrubbing them with a dye pen. This is another Back one. To the co angler thing, I always tell them to leave that dye in their truck. I got dye pens. I don't need your dye on my carpet. Yeah, the, the pins are the way to go, the marker. Yeah, they I just keep a bunch of them up there and I tell the guy when he gets in my boat, help yourself. You don't need to get your dye out. Yep. So here's another one. This Ooh. is a little beaver style, but you got the real slender. No big flanges on there. So this is definitely something I'm going to throw in a little bit colder water. Right. Action. But perfect for a jig. That's perfect. awesome. That's a great looking bait. I wish I could smell them. You got any smell oh, yeah. to them? Oh, good, man. I smell like cotton candy. You like cotton candy? And then this frog... Oh, Gabe and I are really checking these frogs out, and they have got some body to them. I mean, they've got a real good thick body. But I can see that. Have, put well, that dude on the back of a black buzz bait. Yeah. Now look, they do open up on the inside. Nice. So you could run that thing weedless, no problem at all. That is beautiful. Yeah, that thing's got some weight to it, man. I yeah, you it can does. Catch that thing a mile. And that's, you know, it's funny you say it because you look at a lot of plastic frogs like that and they they're tend to be on the lighter side. Well, it's because they search toads a lot. They're, they're probably they're, saving money not putting the material into them. They'll give them the heft. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you want that frog. You want that frog to have an impression, you know, put a little pressure on that mat if you're swimming on mats. Now, Harry, you were just talking about this. There you go. Cinco. Or that's nice. Trick worm, whatever, or not trick worm, but a stick bait. Stick bait. So. Man, that is a beautiful color. Describe what the, the flake that's in there. Is that gold again? It's got like a blue and gold flake. So, Man, those are sharp, dude. This guy's going to have somebody trying to buy him out in a hurry. Those are good-looking baits. This, uh, I like this one a lot. This is a really good color around here. Oh, yeah. Getting, getting hard to open the packages here. Okay. This is awesome over Christmas time to be unboxing. It's perfect. Yeah. Oh, so boy. That, I don't know if you can see that color. A little I bit. can see that hue of blue running through it for sure. Yeah, it's a looking color. That's a good mix. Yeah. Really good. We call that color beautiful. Me and Jerry call that beautiful. We uh we fish a Cinco in that similar color. Are you sure he's not talking to a sandwich? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. I heard Jerry talks dirty to a sandwich. <laughs> he does, man. He's talks. He's. I gotta shut him up. He's oh, saying, "Sandwich is so there. beautiful." Back now, there, finessing is, it. He's got a, a special bag for it. <laughs> one I really did not want to show. And I'll show you why in just a second. So we've seen plenty of white baits out there, but look how translucent this thing is. Oh wow, that's a true albino. That's a clear yeah. water killer. Yeah, that is. I am that reminds me. That reminds me of the. Uh, I forget what brand it was, but remember, uh, Brent Ayler at Table Rock would throw them in a bunch of a, a thing of water and let them set in there for weeks until the kind of dye got out of them and they were more translucent. The grubs that he was fishing at Table Rock. Yep. That's what that. That's what that reminds me of. You ever find it? You ever snag an old crappie jig and then it, it becomes translucent? It's been yep. down there for a long time. Yep. That's exactly what that reminds me of. So that, oh, that's kind of a brush hog style. Yep. Brush hog, yep. That make a good jig trailer in the too. That's when you're throwing big nasty jigs in the summertime with that. 
Man, that brush hog is the deal on the back of a jig. That ba I throw that baby brush hog a lot on a finesse jig. Just kind of mm -hmm. cut about an inch of it off. Oh, it, it works good. Guy at Kentucky Lake showed that to me several years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Mike McClellan showed that to me, the whole throwing a brush hog. So this is definitely a, a trailer I'll be using for my jigs. Nice. A nice Twin tail rig. grub. Great on a swim jig. Yep. And Texas rig. Hey, right now. Spread that open. Did it have a metal appendage yeah. as well? So I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, it's, got, it's a male. It's, it's got a yeah. wiener. It's got a wiener on it. Got a wiener, yeah. Nice. Hold it out there. I would definitely dye that wiener bright red. <laughs> <laughs> you would. Red rock. Put a little orange on the tip. Orange on the tip. A rooster. <laughs> I think he's been down at the farm too long. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I got a I got a chicken joke for it or a chicken story. Let me, wait, let me we'll just take a little pause. We got a few more of these left. It doesn't involve the size of the egg, does it? <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> like pre-egg. We'll go with pre-egg. So this guy on my route. Which uh, came first? Huh? Which, which came, came first? Man, I don't know, dude. <laughs> the chicken or the egg? It almost has to be the chicken to lay the egg. I don't. I don't know, man. We can. Who we came can the most, it. Craig? You know, like tic tac toe. You can never win. Um. So this guy on my route. I deliver. I deliver. I'm a letter carrier for the postal service. This guy on my route lives right in the city. We live in a city. It's about, I don't know, it's like 3,500 people or 35,000 people. I was going to say. Yeah, 35,000 people. And this dude buys seven chickens. So he's wanting to he's wanting to get some farm fresh eggs, right? He's got the little coop set up in the back. And they're supposed to be hens because hens lay eggs, right? Well, somehow they snuck a rooster in there, okay? So this thing starts cockadoodle doing. He's got the neighbors mad they're coming over on their little neighbor neighborly walks telling him hey you need to tone that down i don't know if the police have been called but anyway they're about to kick him out of the neighborhood so he lost one of his chickens to a hawk too actually the other day i just found out sucker just swooped down and one of them city hawks but so he buys this <laughs> this is crazy he buys this choker this is a true story you can buy a rooster choker it's like a choke collar it goes around their neck <laughs> yeah real deal so Every time this uh, rooster tries to cockadoodle do, it's like crap. <laughs> you got him all choked up. He's bound. <laughs> so, buddy, man, you're uh, you're out there choking your chicken right in front of all your neighbors. I was gonna say now we know where that came from. What kind of man yeah. are you, man? But yeah, he's got it all figured out now. <laughs> hey, we have a hawk that comes around here, Gabe. That's got a squirrel or two out of my backyard. Yeah, yeah, they're deadly, man. They're stealthy. Dude, there's that's nothing cool. like when you see them actually just fold them wings and drop like a rocket. Yeah, and it's, it's like right. a. Just like a tomahawk missile, man, comes flying down and smokes it. So here's another one. Same age while I go. A real slender look, but does have the different four on there. You know, man, what I like about that, too, is it's got the appendages, but a pair of scissors, if you don't want them and you're punching or they want something a little more subtle, just trim them. It's best to have them, and if you don't want them, you can trim them off. You know? Yeah. Can't add them. No. But if All you're right. on there. I'll show you a few more here. Um, well, here's this little worm here. Nice. Done. Little what is that? that looks is that smaller than a seven inch? Or is that about a seven inch? I think it's about it's about a seven six, inch. Seven, yeah. Six point three five. Yeah. <laughs> looks good though. He's got some crappie stuff too. Um, he's got a few uh, a few little curly tails. Which right now this is a good time to be throwing these little suckers around. Just your standard little curly tail, little. Oh wow! Yeah, twister. Yeah, got a lot of action. These things. Just kind of an off-white color, kind of an eggnog color, and then he's also mm -hmm. got a. Is that like a swim bait or a fluke? I just kind of seen you. Yeah, we're getting yeah, to that. We're, we're getting, getting there. All right, all right. Crappy right. bait, real quick. I'm looking for something for the back of my chatter bait. Chatter bait. These are kind of like the little bar Bobby Garland type. Uh, crappie. Oh wow! A little squid Billy. Yeah, man. They just got a little bit of action. You can sit there and shake them, put them on a light jig head. So, crappie guys, you you know what I'm talking about. All right, man. Let's uh, let's break out some of these. These are these are some of my favorite. Smallmouth beaver jokes, now chicken joker. <laughs> Whoever thought that the crappie guys would be spending as much as us bass guys on rods and electronics and all that stuff? Yeah, I know. Good advertising, good marketing. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh yeah. Nice little paddle tail there. Thump thump thump. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice looking bait. She got a slender and body. 
the bottoms. Fully oh open. yeah. That's not what so you, you Yeah, that's nice. So you got the option to go either way with those. You ever see a lot of guys flip that paddle tail upside down on their chatter bay? Mm-hmm. These, these are really. Oh, I'm, trust really me, juicy, I got all over my hands. You have to go wash your hands in a minute. We got a couple little, more to show you. Yep. Little fluke. Style. Oh, that's like the original fluke style. Yeah, that'd be really nice on the back of a chatter bay. Sometimes you don't want that paddle tail on a chatter bay. <laughs> that one had extra oil. Yeah, that one's got some extra funk to that one. Yeah. Woo hoo! Dang. It's ready for the massage, Paul. <laughs> John, what is the uh, what is that? Or, that's uh, the secret sauce, John. No kidding. Okay. Holy cow. <laughs> you can see Some of that quantum hot sauce. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a good chef, man. You got to put some extra sauce on there. Oh, yes. on that. We get into oh, some yes. of the good stuff here. Oh my, that's well, sexy. Yeah, that's very. That, you did a great job on that. That is yeah. beautiful. Really nice golden strip. Nice slender design. It's like about a five-inch paddle tub. Yeah. I believe. And the one thing that Gabe and I were talking about is you look at the look at how slender that tail is all the way back. Yeah, I mean it's not gonna it's not gonna catch a lot of water. It's gonna have, and I mean this thing is, you know, guys with the big swim baits always talk about how limber they are. I mean that's, yeah, that's that is flaccid. Yeah, I could definitely fish that in the winter, no problem. All right, I get to show this one, and there's another color in that same. Bait. Oh my god, that is awesome. Yeah, that's nice. That's good work right there. You put some porn music in front of that guy. Yes, waka waka. waka, 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 waka. Like said, all of them are set up to where they can be. Completely weedless, too. They got that big cavity in there. Put that away, man. It's, it's making me horny. Stop that, Greg. <laughs> All right. Taco Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <I'm> on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so a bunch of great baits, guys. Um, he's got – he's on Facebook, right? Yes. You can check him out on Facebook. If you're interested, yeah. get a hold of him. Send him a private message, um, and he can – I don't know what all he does as far as pouring custom colors, but I'm sure uh, we're going to find out because I, I, I can see two or three things right there that I could and just work real really, really like to express my uh, how I'd like to some colors made. Let me get back up here. The time he removed 53 squirrels from his backyard. There, yeah, there's there's the link right there. There's his phone number. Where is that at? Oh, yeah. Tom says I've removed 53 squirrels from my backyard since July. Jesus. Dang. You look over my shoulder, there's a an, there's an, uh, cache of air rifles behind me for the squirrels that are in my backyard. Me and somebody needs a pet hawk. Yeah, I'm no thinking. kidding. Yeah, I'm shooting uphill. I got the disadvantage. Me and my neighbor were in a competition, but he's shooting downhill. I, I worry about breaking windows. Plus, I have that Benjamin. It's so damn, it sounds like a 22 going off. Yeah, so, you hope it was but, yeah, Morrison said too. He, with the the uh, swim baits, he can make them a full body. No, they don't have to have the slot in them. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, that's that's. I'm real interested in those. That yeah, was my next yeah. question. So, some you can throw on a uh, on a jig head. And tackle yeah, jump bait for the back of a chatterbait or a swim bait. Yeah. Or a swim, the tackle swim bait. You know, we, we well, we kind of did change the time because we used to be at seven, but we've been at seven thirty for. Yeah, we're going a little. Long. Yeah, we're going a little long too. We got into some baits and. Um, this color right here, man. Did you you showed this to me? Yes. Oh, I love that. That's that looks like that. Uh, I call it the high may, but it's like that dirty Sanchez color from yep. the sweet beaver. Oh my, yeah. Oh, That's a killer. If you guys haven't thrown this color in the beaver, you yep. need to be throwing it. It's a killer. Get all these back in there. So what you got on your side over there, Mikey? Uh, well, first of all, I just wanted to show that uh, I was telling you about this. This is an old Daiwa. Can you guys see that? Sure. Yeah. yeah. It looks like something from Star Wars. It's an old Daiwa high. This is the first bait caster I got like at 12 years old. I think it's a Daiwa P. I don't even know what the a PL100 Pro Light. It was like one of the first low profile bait casters back in. Nice. Well, I'm guessing I got this in like 1982 and I've held on to it forever. I'm actually thinking I cut a piece of plastic milk jug to make a washer in here 100 years ago. I'm thinking about sending it over to Trey and, and uh, seeing if he could fix that issue do something with my milk jug washer and put some bearings in it and i might uh i might take it out and give it a cast just to see but nothing else it's an old dial i'm gonna keep it forever it's got a short I, handle on it doesn't it oh real short handle yeah. and i don't even know what the gear ratio is it does tell you that it how much 10 pound or 12 pound line it will hold it will hold 125 yards of 10 and 98 
95 yards or 12. That was seemed like that was more important than the gear ratio back in the day, apparently, to tell you how much line it would hold. I'm guessing it's in the five. five. Yeah, it's probably in the four to five range. With that short, you could improve that with that handle length for sure. But yeah, that's yeah. A, it's just a, it's amazing to me, man. Daiwa's been making quality stuff. I'm a lose guy, but you can't go wrong with Daiwa. They've been making quality stuff for a long time. Mm-hmm. I keep, I'm just holding on to that. So like one of my kids someday can is put that, that the in the line on there too. <laughs> Damn near. It's Mono. probably from the mid eighties. Yeah. yeah. It's probably from the mid eighties when I retired it, but wow. Yeah. It's uh, or just crap. Okay. <laughs> Somebody will sell this. My kid will sell this on their, how much is this thing worth in Bathmaster 10, 20 years from now? I think I had a black max. I think that's the first bait, bait catcher that I used. Um, the Man, I have the, do you remember the old Shimano with the fighting drag? Uh, Roland no. Martin was pimping that. So what it was, was it was a switch, almost like a safety on a gun. And it was completely locked down for setting the hook. And you flipped it up and it went to the drag mode. And then it would, t- then the drag would be engaged. Okay. So you could have it completely locked down with that switch down. Now, what, with today's technology, why that's went away, I don't know. It seems like a really good idea. Well, they had the flipping, the flipping pitch switch or the flipping switch on some of those reels. Where you would just, yeah, where it would just when you let go of the locked, yeah, yeah. I hate but it. this was this was like if you were just fishing in it, you know, once you'd already engaged the reel, you could have that drag completely locked down, and when you set the hook, and once you got the fish hooked, you could flip it up and hit the turn the drag on, basically. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm losing my rod when, when I set when I bow up on a muskie or something with that. Yeah, possibly. I also had the old, I still have it, the old Abu Garcia two speed. It was one speed reel until there was tension on it, and then it downshifted and went to a lower gear ratio. Yeah. But apparently that didn't nobody cared because it went away. You know, it's kind of like wire fences still around because they work, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? People haven't stopped building fences because they don't work. But That's no, a- I got this box from Trey at his uh, Black Friday special. And there's a couple really cool colors in here. Uh, this is what he calls the table rock killer, I think, right here. If you can see that. Try to hold yeah. it. Yeah. He's supposed to be picking some of those up. Is that a duo blank? That's a duo. Yeah, they're a duo blank. I got four of those and uh, two in the two in the shallow and couple in the deep mm-hmm. that's nice yeah, and it's got that chartreuse back in you know if you can see that i've mike 10 maybe 10 foot on, on 10 pound test yeah you're probably going to get it around 10 foot and what okay. i like about trey for the old men like me he puts the oval you probably can't see it but the oval split rings on there so you so you don't have to worry about it when you're tying these this is probably the color i throw the most honestly at lake of the ozarks it's that white with the chartreuse belly. What's Pearl he calling white. it? Uh, what's he calling it? Table rock. Pearl with the chartreuse belly. The other one's called the table rock killer. This is called Pearl with a chartreuse belly. You know, it's funny you show that because Mark Menendez was talking the other last week about his crank guard and jerk baits like that. And he said he really likes to have that different color flash like a chartreuse or just a plain white belly on the bottom. Yeah. And, of course, this is a classic. You can't go wrong with a clown colored bait, you know. It's it's yeah. I've got two of the biggest bass at Lake of the Ozarks on a clown color. Yeah, yeah. I like white belly a lot. Yeah, like, I need to throw that chartreuse belly around a lot more. I don't, I don't this, do enough. This is his perch gill that he paints. I really like this one too. Yeah, that's sexy, man. That's sexy. I would think around the docks at Lake of the Ozarks, that thing would just get murdered. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great color. So those were the colors I requested, and then I said, surprise me with the, the, the additional bait because I ordered what is it two four six eight ten if you ordered eleven you got a free box and a free wake bait so I didn't know that when I told him to give me ten and he said this was his color and, and mm. I think he called it pearl shad it's got a little chartreuse in the front a little bit in the in the back end there and that's a, a bit eight too right it's like a 78 or something no I, I think it's a 100 is it a 100 I think so. Just yeah. That's yeah. a nice color, man. Really nice. So then, what belly you know, on? what's that? On that, the belly. You said. Yeah, the belly. It's it's just kind of a almost translucent kind of a. Okay. Yeah, it's just kind of a cur- pearl colored, I guess you would say. 
It's got that tail and then it's got the throat, you know, the two different mm -hmm. colors there. Mm -hmm. that. It's got a black, kind of a black back. Yeah, I like that a lot. It looks good. Kind of a black with a, it's almost like a blue. It's not really black. If you see it at the right angle, you can tell that it's blue. I can't really get it yeah. to the right angle, but get the light. Yeah. And then the the wake bait that came with it's kind of a new, clearer kind of perch color thing that he's got going on there. Crazy! It looks like it just got out of bed. Yeah, these things are the right time of year in the fall, early spring. These things are deadly. It's got some probably good looks, noise too. I'll say, probably looks like a rooster after that choke collar for a week, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I don't know what I, he would have to tell you, but I think that I don't know what hooks they are. But man, they're sticky on all these, especially this wake bait. But on all of them, I don't know Look for sure what brand it is. Look like round bends. It might be still long enough. <laughs> I can't really tell. Well, Monster. they're yeah, they're they're definitely round bends, but I think I'm not sure if they're gamagatsu or looks like a gammy. It's they're sticky though, yeah. But we always joke about that, right? How much tackle do you need? And I, I found a lose bag down there with like ten or fifteen jerk baits, not even out of the box. And when when Trey had this going, I was like, yeah, why wouldn't I? With that at that price, why wouldn't I get eleven more so I could get a get a free box, which I got ten or fifteen completely empty boxes. You had but, some mega bass in there too, didn't you? In that little. Oh yeah, I've got tons of mega bass in that. Still Jeez. haven't taken out of the box yet that I ordered from Japan when we were, that particular color was working. Yeah, he's supposed to be painting me some of those too. I, yeah, I, I don't even know what the name of it is. It's some Japanese name, but yeah, yeah. Trey painted some of that color for me too. It's kind of They're, a deep weed color. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we got to tell the dead man story. So. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's get. Yeah, well, so this was I, uh, Dave would have to remind me how many years ago it was. I'm saying, good lord, what year did we get married? 2004. Was the dead man hole? Was you, that was when we were dating? Uh, she the ones holding your cue cards? I was wondering. No. Anyway, doesn't matter. I'm saying it was 12 years ago. She said they married 74. <laughs> Dude, you're like 97. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, she's over there. She's over there working. She doesn't know what's what going on. So let's uh, go dead man. So there's a spot on the Missouri side of the Clark Bridge going into Alton. It's an old borrow pit. Best I can tell, I don't know how it's connected to the Mississippi. I don't think it is. If it is, it's by a culvert pipe, but me and Dave have never found it. We were over there, and a buddy of mine is from Alton had joined us, and we were in a tiny-ass little V-bottom boat. There is no ramp. We just drop the boat in, lock the truck in four-wheel drive, and drop it down over the bank and put it in. And we were fishing. Of course, at that time, it was July 4th because my buddy Brad was home from San Diego. So the water was down considerably. And we go over this something, and I'm like, the water kind of had cleared up by that point, too, in the spring. And I'm like, what is that, Dave? And he's like, that looks like an antenna. And I'm like, yeah, but it's got to be attached to something. I think that's a car. And he's like, well, that's not a, I was like, he goes, wonder how long that's been in here. And I was like, well, cars with that kind of antenna, that can't be, it's not like it's old. You know, it's like a more of a modern looking antenna. Long story short, Dave gets down and I kind of hold on to him and he, goes under the water and he starts trying to clear it off and he comes up and he's bleeding. He cut his hand on the windshield when he was trying to clear the moss off the windshield. Uh. So you can tell somebody's head had hit the, somebody, something had hit the windshield. So I'm like, hmm. So then we're curious, right? Dave being Dave, he sticks a freaking paddle. You know, I'm trying to hold the boat still. still. Dave sticks a paddle in the door and he's trying to pry it open because you can tell where it went. Where it's at, there's no way the doors could have opened because it's in some flooded timber. Now, now, wait, hold on a second. Did did Dave keep his clothes on for this? Because he's in the oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He had his clothes. Well, he might have stripped his shirt off because he was going in head first. Okay, he had his shoes and his shorts on. And 
he's got a paddle in there and his face is right down by the water. Right. And Dave's leaning into it, trying to pry that door open. And all he does is get at the brake seal. And when it breaks seal, like a bubble comes gurgling up and Dave immediately pukes into the water, like the smell hit him. And he oh. looks at me and I look at him and I'm like, Oh dude, there's a dead body in there. No doubt. You know, if that smell came out of there and we're like, so we, we finished fishing. We just go ahead and go on and go keep fishing. You know, it's like, well, it's been in there long enough. It's covered with moss. Dave called, right yeah. Dave calls the St. Charles County Sheriff. Cause it's technically in St. Charles County there. And they kind of blow it off. I think they told him uh, it's, it had to be like an insurance job or something. And I'm like, insurance job, even if it is an insurance job, isn't that your, don't you want to investigate? You know, like it's somebody's car, you know, it's, it's in there backwards. Who, who, who does the insurance job in reverse? Nobody that I know that's like, Hey man, I know how we'll get them to really buy this. We'll put it in reverse. You know, no, <laughs> nobody thinks that it's so long story short, time goes by and nobody's, you know, Dave's called like twice and they've not done anything. So me and Dave got a hold of each other. I was like, dude, I got a couple friends that are cops. My brother's an underwater rescue guy. I can borrow a good mask from him or something. We'll go down there and try to take the license plate off, get it up, and we'll just take it to the cops, let him run it and see what the deal is, you know. He was like, Yeah, let's do that. You know, and we made a arrangements. It'd be like a week or two before we could get together. Dave's coming back to Alton driving home from or his job, and he sees a car hanging on a tow hook and the media is there and there's cops there. There's a, you know, like channel four news or something's there. Dave does a UE cause it's a divided lane road. There comes around and comes up and tells them the whole story about how, you know, we've, we found this car. Turns out before I get to that, it was MoDOT guys were working on the road and they'd stopped next to the water and decided to go sit on the edge of the guardrail. And it, again, this is like a summer later or maybe two summers later, the water's even lower so they can physically see the car, like the top of it sticking out. So the MoDOT guys call the state police and the state police come and do something about it, pull it out. So Dave's standing there talking to him and says, hey, I called. There's records of me calling like last year or two years ago, whatever it was. He called multiple times. Turns out it was a guy that had been missing for whatever it was, a year or two years. He went over to the Alton Bell and then never came back. His family didn't know whether he struck it rich and took off. He got abducted or what happened. Well, it, it turns out it had snowed that night and he was coming across the coming back into Missouri and came off that bridge. And there's kind of like a little hump there. And when he did hit an icy spot, and lost control of his car and slid off and flew off backwards into that lake that we always fished. And that car had been in there. They didn't know what happened to their dad, their uncle, whatever, you know, whoever, their family member. They had no idea. Couldn't collect insurance, couldn't do anything because nobody knew if he was dead, alive, just ran off to, you know, won a bunch of money at the casino and took off for Canada. Who knew? So that kind of concluded that case. And I'm 99% sure that the deputy sheriff ended up getting fired over the whole deal because he went out and checked twice and didn't do shit about it. So the guy that when Dave stopped and told him, he's like, well, this jackass just blew us off every time he i think dave was there with him when he case showed up and like well yeah it looks like a car but yeah what are you gonna do you know it's like what do you mean what are you gonna do aren't you a cop you don't you want to know why that car's in there backwards you know it's like so yeah that's why we call it the dead man hole because me and dave is just two fishing we're smart enough to know me and him both thought well we should have been obviously should have been private or uh detectives because we're a hell of a lot smarter than that jackass it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out you don't do an insurance job backwards there's a big smash on the windshield we could tell somebody's head it hit it stunk to high heaven when we broke it open there's definitely a corpse in there but that cop went and i'm glad they found it before we got dumb enough to go down there with a mask and a screwdriver and try to take the license plates off that's but, that's cra that's crazy man i don't even get that you know when something like that happens around here on the Mississippi river, they'll get right away. They'll get down there. They'll have divers that get down there and they'll put the lift underneath. And, and so they yeah, but nobody knew they just reported the guy missing. They didn't know where, what happened to him. Yeah. But you, you reported. Yeah. That. Yeah. We did it. But you know, that cop was just being like, Oh, that's paperwork. You know, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not going to mess with that. 
that's that's just weird to me too. It's like, what the hell else you doing? You know? Oh, yeah. I get it. You're handing out speeding tickets and not having your seatbelt on. You know? Dave, said it, Dave said it was an 18 year veteran that got canned. Yeah, you can't yeah. do that, man. Get that's it. getting lazy, right? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, so I told him it wasn't groceries. <laughs> Yeah. Right. I mean, he won't stay spoiled. It bothered me and Dave more than it did the goddamn guy that swore an oath to the St. Charles County kind of thing. You know, it's like that's somebody, somebody. There's somebody in that car. There's we had no doubt there was somebody in it. Now, if that car was like a 1942 Studebaker or something, been like, yeah, I could see that. But you could tell it was a late model car. You know, you could tell it was in the 90s. I gotta I gotta ask something real quick. Did before they drug that car off, did you throw a three quarter ounce football jig and drag it across the hood? You know he did. <laughs> no, no, that was that was when me and Dave were into flipping tubes. I bet we flipped tubes at it. Flip the tube, yeah. 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 Flip the tube. And by the way, I used to drop my full size Ranger in there, and that kind of screwed up the whole dead man hole because when a guy's willing to drop a full size fiberglass boat with power poles and four graphs on it in there to fish. People probably get the idea when they drive by it. I bet there's fish in there. Yeah. Small water charters was thinking the water was probably chummed. He's wondering if the fish bit better near the car. <laughs> catfish. I'm sure there was catfish in the area. Yeah. Yeah. The windows, I don't think anybody could get in and get to him. They were just cracked enough that the funk was coming out of them. That's probably where the crack came from. Those big, like 75 pound flathead trying to smash the window. Smash, yeah, it could have been. Yeah. Yeah, but that was a crazy story, man. When we looked at that and we just started kind of doing the math in our head, like, wait a minute, a car backwards? Something's going on here, you know? That's crazy. And, and we fished there a million times, but me and Dave never fished. If we fished there in the summertime, it was usually at night because it was super hot and you would have never seen it. But my buddy happened to be home for the 4th of July, wanted to go fishing. So I called Dave. I was, I was like, you want to go fishing or you want to catch fish? Because I can take you out in the Mississippi. We might not catch anything, but I know if we go – Get Dave's. A, this is before I knew I could lock the suburban and four low and just drop that ranger in there. You had to have the right partner, you know. And Dave was that right partner. Dave would get out in the water way steep, say, Come on back, come on back, you're fine. You know, you know, he got in there and made sure there was no big drop offs or anything. Dave so, says you're holding out, man. He said you guys jacked the seven pounder off the front bumper. <laughs> <laughs> I know that we caught some giant fish there over the years, and we also seen some zoo quality snakes in that son of a gun. Oh, I bet. Mm. And we we heard multiple. I don't know whether they, I don't think they were shootings. If you don't know much about Alton, there's a lot of bikers related with Alton, and there's a lot of like when we'd be night fishing in there, be a lot of late night because there's a duck boat ramp on the other side of the levee. Be a lot of bikes pulling there, and you could hear them chatter. And the next thing you know, you could hear gunfire. They were down there like setting up cans and shooting the cans and shit against that levee, using it as their backdrop. Yeah, so there's yeah. a lot of crazy shit that went, but. They built a new, you know, it was this was after the new Alton Bridge. Man, you get a clear night and that Alton Bridge lit up, you could see pretty damn good the fish in there at night. It was kind of cool. Hmm. You know, me and Dave did a lot of from seven o'clock at night till nine o'clock the next morning in that place in the summertime. And dude, it was like I said, it was a borrow pit. So the bottom just went, it just rolled like this. It would be three feet, then eight feet, then five feet, then four feet, then seven feet, then flatten off for a while and then go back to doing that rolling. And right where the flooded timber ended, there was a definite tree line there and it just broke down into the deep part of it where it was 35, 40 feet. You'd see big spoon bills in there. So every after like the flood of 93, the water got up into there. And then once the water went back down, everything was pretty much stuck in there. So a lot of the bass got in there when the water went back down, they were just there. And it wasn't connected to the river enough, if it was, that the water would clear up and it would be like fish in a lake, not the river. There's no current. The water would clean up, you know, and there was just big old hardwood and stuff in there, lay downs everywhere. It was it was a blast to fish. And it's pretty much got pounded probably for the last few years. But a lot of people fish it from the bank and you'd have to be the I'm way too scared of snakes to fish from the bank at that place. Cause I seen some giant snakes in there and it ain't like anybody's cutting the grass around the edge of that thing. And it's all just like rock and grass and I'd screw that shit. I wouldn't be able to get it out of my head. So yeah, I never fit in the bank. I've been in some places like that, man. As a kid, I don't know that I'd go, go back in there anymore. Uh, Hey, we're going to wrap this up, Mike. Uh, that, man. 
you guys haven't hit the thumbs up, please do that. Support the channel. Um, next week's guest is going to be Jay Beffa. He's he was. Oh my uh, God, you got Jay on? Yeah, we're going to have Jay on here. Um, so awesome. Jay was the uh, Missouri. He let me see. I got to get this right here. I keep screwing this up. Let me take a deep breath. Okay, he won the Bass Nation Central Championship on Toledo Bend. And that, that qualified him to fish the Bash Nation TNT Fireworks Championship on Pickwick Lake. So we're going to get him on here next week. Um, we're going to – he's he's uh, fished Lake of the Ozarks a lot, so we're going to have some he's good – He's a great fish, man. He's a good dude too, yeah. Yeah, so we'll talk about we'll talk about the whole uh, Bass Nation deal, and we'll talk about – Lake the Bass Nation Lake. magazine, this, this, this issue. That's right. That's right. He was, he's was he got it. He's on Bass uh, – what was it? Bass Nation, the Bassmaster the, for the for the nation members. Yeah, yeah, he's got a little article in there. A tree, right? I want I want an article written about me in Bass Nation. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty sweet, man. I saw that. I'm like, heck yeah, dude. So yeah, yeah, yeah he's he's, so he's, gonna be on, he's gonna be on here next week. Should be a good time. And in the fall, the week after that, we're gonna have Bass Geek, who's a YouTuber from down south to Georgia, Alabama area. So he he's fun. I've talked to him a couple times. He's gonna be he's gonna be a good guest. So. Um, Make you gotta sure work on Mr. Shakur to get on here too. <laughs> gotta get Marcus on here sometime. I have to work yeah. on him. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll, I'll reach out to him. Um, sometimes yeah, I, like it, get, uh, I like to get Matt Robertson on here too. Sometime that dude's a squirrel, man. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that'll happen or not, but we'll we'll keep reaching out and just continue to get. I bet people. you wouldn't be hard to get Eric Bray to come on here and talk to you too. Yeah, or Pete, maybe Pete. Or Eric, I mean, they've got a guide business to promote. They'll come on and do, you know, for, for that alone. They got a but lot of good stuff. To they got to to both of those guys for table rocker, a wealth of information. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll, uh, we'll work on that, man. We'll work on that. So yeah, that's a good thing you guys are getting Lake of the o or Ozarks guys and Southern Illinois. That way you can kind of diversify your, your listeners and followers, you know? Yeah. I feel like I'm leaving Missouri at all the time. It's a big market to be tapped into in the Ozarks, dude. Yeah. Of sticks, Illinois a lot too, and I need yeah, to get there's Missouri roots. Yeah, so, so, we don't have any water around. <laughs> yeah, so all right, Mike, we're gonna let you go, bro, man. Thanks, you guys. I had a great time as always. Merry Christmas to everybody. If I don't see you, yep. and uh, we'll do this around a fire sooner than later, Greg. Yep, absolutely. Sounds I'll good. Bring the, I'll bring I'll bring the bourbon. We'll uh, we'll go with Matthew McConaughey's new Longhorn, whatever it is. The uh, he's got a wild turkey brand out there, so. We'll, I'll bring that down around the fire. Definitely. That'll work. That'll work. All right, boys. Thanks a lot for having me and uh, be safe over the holidays, everybody. Yeah. All right. Merry Christmas, man. Merry Christmas, man. See you. All right, guys. Well, that was a good two hour show. So, yeah, it was nice. Well. It went by quick, man. Yeah. I got, I got to see some really sweet jerk baits um, by Trey, and then we got to see some really sweet plastics by Morris and Sons. Yeah, customs he's got his name up there, name and number. If you guys want to get a hold of him? He's got a lot of cool stuff going on. I know he's been pouring just about every day, so I'm sure he's got a lot more to show yet. Yeah, so thanks for Mike coming on here. It was a great man. I love talking to Mike. I don't get to talk to him enough, so it's good that we get to catch up. We got a lot of. I mean, we'll have we'll continue to have him on um, throughout the, the following year because he's got stories, we got stories, and it's fun to just get on here. Sometimes you just a little bit of break from just straight up fishing stuff. Um, I like stories, man. I like hearing about yeah. where people came from, just like that dead man story. That's wild. Could you imagine? I'm, I've always I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be there. I'm always scared. I'm going to hook a like a body or something and drag it in. When I was catfishing the Mississippi River all the time, you better hope it's on one of your finesse rigs. You just break it off. <laughs> no kidding, man. Every <laughs> once in a while, you hit, you like set into like a, a towel or something that was really oh, yeah. heavy. Yep. And you're like, this isn't like, this has got some weight to it. I don't know what it is, but you're kind of scared to actually pull it up out of the water. The, wor the worst are the stupid catfish, the old window weights hanging on strings. Oh, you go yeah, to set yeah. into those and it, the thing starts tumbling down the whatever it's on or yeah, whatever. It's, if you think it's really something. It's like somebody's leg or a yeah. hand or something. <laughs> I don't even want to, I just want to cut my line and walk away. So. Yeah. But, but as you, a fisherman, you're always curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Definitely. All right, guys, we're going to get out of here, man. Uh, appreciate you guys coming on here and spending some time with us. Uh, Merry Christmas to yes, everybody. Absolutely. Everybody, I hope everybody has a good, safe holidays. So, And we will see you uh, next, next Monday. Monday. Yeah. Same time, same place. All right. See you guys.